Hello, buenos días, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Fundación Mafre and this uh, European Traffic Education Seminar 2022. My name is Jesús Monclus, and uh, I'm working in Fundación Mafre in the Department of Injury Prevention and Road Safety. Although we are here in Madrid, in Spain, and uh, because most of uh, the attendants, actually I was just told that uh, more than 150 people are following this seminar. We are a smaller group here in Madrid, but a very special and important group. Uh, so I will give you a very short welcome before giving the floor to Eddie Klinen from the Flemish Foundation for Traffic Knowledge and Antonia Venoso, who will be closing this welcome an introductory uh, part of the seminar. MAFRE Foundation is a non-profit organization that was created uh, almost 50 years ago. It's working now in 28 countries in five different areas of activities, from social action, around 100 international projects at this time, culture, Unfortunately, we cannot, for those who are here today with us, we cannot offer you a painting or photography exhibition because we are in between two exhibitions and they're preparing the next one and, and the museum is now closed. We also have uh, activities in health promotion, insurance, culture and social security. And finally, as I mentioned, uh, injury prevention and road safety. Um, one of the latest uh, newspaper articles that I read was discussing about the number of uh, pedestrian fatalities here in the city of Madrid. Almost 100 child pedestrians have been injured so far in 2022 only. And uh, most likely, as we still have some months to go, this figure will likely um, grow, continue to grow. And we already know that there's been at least one child pedestrian fatality here in the city of Madrid. On the other side, and, and uh, you've seen that we've managed to arrange for some rain. So for those of you coming from Central Europe, you will not miss rain anymore. You know that we are in a very serious uh, climate emergency and uh, the drought is very intense in all the countries in Europe. So we take together weather emergency and we take together traffic injury emergency and we come to what we are discussing today, which is a higher sustainability for everybody, but in particular for our children. We have a great opportunity with a new curricula for primary and secondary education in Spain. Some new legislative, decre legislative decrees were approved earlier this year in, in March. And those new curricula we will be discussing and Maria Jose Aparicio from the Spanish Directory for Traffic will be presenting those um, uh, innovations in our education system will be focusing on sustainability and the promotion of active transport modes. In this sense, we are very proud in Fundación Mafre that we are cooperating with organizations and NGOs such as Stop Accidents in, in a specific program to promote work to school. Of course, our longest lasting collaboration with ASLEME, uh, concentrating in this case more in the teenager age group. And um, what I might uh, even call the best the bet of our lives, at least in this instant in time, which is the program SDG Planet, developed by Fundación Mafre, that is uh, discussing and, and working on both home injuries and safe mobility. It, this program contains or is based on a new whole virtual world that can be visited by students. Uh, is complemented, of course, by on street activities. We are working on new traffic safety units in Spain and also in the United States. And we've seen that the SDG program is already working in countries such as El Salvador or Peru. 
Uh, I just want to thank you, uh, everybody. Uh, I want to thank, uh, first of all, MAFRE and all its employees and customers, because they are who make our Fundación MAFRE activities possible, of course, Fundación MAFRE as a whole, our injury prevention and road safety team, in particular, Susana and Angela, who have been really working so hard in, in, prepa in preparing this seminar, also Fernando Camarero and the rest of the colleagues in the department. I want to thank all the participants, those who are here in Fundación Mafre today and those who are connected via streaming. And I also want to thank all the technicians and the translators and also the catering providers, by the way. Um, express, I want to express, just to close this brief in welcome today, my sincere admiration for the European Transport Safety Council. I think that uh, if we think uh, uh, in, a, in an aggregated contribution towards road safety and injury prevention and safe mobility and sustainable mobility in Europe and more uh, internationally at worldwide level, I cannot think of any other organization, you know, maybe together with the World Health Organization and the European Union as a whole. I think that the, for Fundación Mafre is a privilege to be involved in ETSC's activities, and in particular in uh, the LEARN project. And we are also tremendously, immensely proud to share this project with the Flemish Foundation for Traffic Knowledge. VSV, and uh, I also want to thank Antonio and Frank and the rest of the ATC team for all your work. I hope that you have a productive and interesting day. I need to leave for some minutes, and I need, must apologize for that, but I will come back in around 50 minutes. We are trying to set up a new activity, uh, or a large one activity, actually, in the Boston area, and we need to discuss whether we are still in time to you know, bring that activity into life. So thank you, and I will be around uh, for the whole day. And I pass the floor to Eddie. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, I have to excuse myself because this will be quite boring because I completely agree with uh, Jesus. It is it is a it is a pleasure to be in in Madrid, of course. Yes, it is even a pleasure to walk in the rain. So thank you for that, uh, uh, and it was also a pleasure because we arrived here on Sunday, and we saw Remco Evenepoel, Flemish cyclist, win the La Vuelta. So it is a pleasure to be in Madrid. I also saw that uh, the best cafe of Madrid, Cafe Gijón, is just around the corner. So it is really a pleasure being in, in Madrid. It's not only a pleasure to be here in Madrid, it's also a pleasure to meet you again in real life. Yes, I know that it is uh, usual to say that it is a privilege and an honor to give the opening words, but especially I would like to emphasize that it is a real pleasure to see you all again. And I can assure you that nobody has aged one day since the beginning of the pandemic. You, you all look better, yes? <laughs> and I'm sure that mm, even though uh, Mafre, ETSC, especially Frank, did a great job during the pandemic and working on this fantastic project, uh, that being able to meet again in real life without the aid of computer screens, sorry for the people attending online, eh, that it will even help us, uh, help us to achieve better results than before. So um, as you can see, I hope, I'm um, really happy to be here amongst you. Uh, I'm looking forward to the presentations, the discussions, and all the work that we can do together on the LEARN project. So thank you, everybody. And now I give the, the floor to Antonio. Yeah. Um, and I also agree about what uh, Jesus said about ETSC. It is a privilege for us uh, of uh, VSV to be a member of the ETSC family. Thank you, Antonio. 
Thank you very much, Eti. Thanks for uh, uh, the nice words. Um, thanks to the uh, Fundación Mafra as well uh, for the nice words. But uh, uh, I can only give them back and say that uh, uh, this great project, which uh, uh, my colleague Frank has uh, um, been carrying for quite a few years now, um, would not be possible without the support of uh, MAPFRE, would not be possible without the support of uh, the VSV. And uh, when I mean support, I do not only mean financial support, but I mean the content, the information, uh, the uh, uh, um, enthusiasm that you and the expert panels that I see many of them in the room today are um, giving uh, to uh, this project. Um, welcome to you. Welcome to uh, the uh, around 150 uh, people online. Um, I wanted to say that uh, today's seminar, which uh, uh, I will have uh, 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 the pleasure to um, um, chair, is divided into three parts. Uh, the first one, we've just started it, it's uh, um, setting the scene about uh, uh, the road safety situation of, uh, of children and youngsters in uh, uh, Europe and uh, uh, the LEARN project. Then uh, um, we will move to part two which is on uh, um, linking education on uh, sustainable mobility and uh, uh, traffic safety. And um, in the afternoon, after the lunch break, uh, we will uh, have uh, uh, the opportunity to listen to various presentations, some of them online, some of them in person, about uh, uh, projects from uh, across Europe on uh, uh, traffic safety and uh, mobility education. So uh, the whole day um, seems to be uh, extremely uh, promising. Um, my uh, presentation today will be on uh, uh, the road safety situation of children and uh, youngsters in Europe. So uh, I've been given the task of uh, uh, setting the scene a bit, creating a bit of the context for uh, uh, the discussions that uh, uh, will uh, uh, be made first. However, uh, before uh, starting this, I wanted to give you a, um, a quick overview also about the European Transport Safety Council and uh, um, the activities we do and general road safety in uh, uh, the European Union. Uh, you can see it on the slide. Uh, we are a, a Brussels-based, independent, non-profit making organization. And uh, we've been around for almost 30 years. Uh, we'll turn 30 at the beginning of 2023. Um, 58 member organizations from uh, uh, across Europe and uh, more than 200 experts contributing to us. And we try and balance also the uh, sources of funding in order to preserve our independence. You can see uh, there is support from the public sector, European Commission, just uh, concluded one with the European Parliament, uh, member organizations, member states, but also um, corporate sponsors. Uh, um, this is what we do. Uh, uh, first and foremost, we uh, uh, monitor and try and influence for the better the uh, EU transport safety policy, but also we have uh, a series of uh, uh, projects, uh, ranking member states, for example, uh, on uh, road safety. You'll see some of the graphs now for this PIN project. Uh, we've just concluded one on uh, exchange of best practice amongst member states. We're working on uh, uh, alcohol, we're working on drugs, we're working on infrastructure, on vehicle safety, and of course uh, uh, we're working on uh, um, education with the LEARN project, which is uh, uh, the reason why uh, we are um, here um, today. Um, we always start uh, with this figure, um, you know it, but uh, uh, we think it's uh, an important reminder every time. 19,123 people lost their lives on uh, uh, a road traffic collision in the European Union in uh, uh, 2021. Uh, this is uh, enormous because uh, it is uh, more than uh, uh, 50 uh, every day. So uh, it still remains uh, in an, uh, an acceptably high uh, number of uh, uh, deaths in the European Union. Um, there has been some progress. This first graph shows progress between uh, uh, 2019 and 2021. 
Normally we would do it with the previous uh, available year, 2020, but you realize that uh, uh, because of COVID it doesn't really make sense to compare 2020, 2021, so we started comparing 2019 with uh, uh, 2021. Uh, um, the uh, European uh, uh, Union as a whole had a reduction, very important, very notable, of uh, 13 percent, one three, 13 percent. Uh, but um, of course these uh, results are still uh, impacted by travel restrictions in many countries but also by the good practice, if I can call uh, it, of uh, uh, increased working from home, which means less exposure. And this can also be uh, seen by the fact that uh, you see that for some of the countries we also have uh, some white histograms that show the uh, um, number of kilometers driven. And you can see that for all the countries that had data on the numbers of kilometers driven, well, these went down. Therefore, we can safely claim that the good uh, improvement uh, over 2019-2021 uh, of 13% uh, uh, has also been uh, um, impacted by the uh, pandemic. Um, longer time period, 2011-2021, uh, uh, great start into uh, the decade with a 16% reductions. Then uh, we had a long period of uh, uh, flattening of the curve, 7% reduction. Then the COVID, of course, 1920, and uh, uh, well, date of 2020 over 2019 with an impressive 17% uh, uh, reduction. And you can see actually that if you look 2020 over 2021, well, the uh, reduction has halted and uh, we already had an increase of only 5%, but still an increase in uh, uh, the number of road deaths. Um, if we take this graph and we look at it by breaking down by country, progress 2011-2021, first, a good news, all of them covered in this graph have uh, uh, reduced the number of road deaths in the decade considered. Um, one EU member state, Lithuania, has uh, halved the number of road deaths, 50% reduction. Uh, Norway has had uh, the best reduction, 52%. Uh, and progress has been slowest in uh, uh, Israel and uh, uh, Romania, which uh, um, you can see on uh, uh, the right-hand side of uh, the graph. Road mortality, number of deaths per million population uh, uh, with colors, well, uh, the bad news is that uh, there is still a big divide between the groups that are performing best in the European Union and uh, those that are uh, performing less well. Uh, there is a difference of a factor of four between the best in class and uh, uh, those that are lagging behind in uh, uh, the European Union. Um, so far, I've concentrated uh, on the number of deaths. We also have this figure which would uh, uh, seriously need some update on uh, uh, the number of those uh, um, seriously injured in uh, uh, the European Union according to uh, the new um, definition. So much about uh, um, general road safety data. Now we go a bit more into the detail. Um, we go a bit more on to the topic of uh, uh, today and uh, we look at this uh, forthcoming learn flash number two on uh, the role of education in uh, reducing deaths among children and youngsters on uh, uh, European roads. I will more be concentrating on uh, uh, the data um, coming from uh, uh, the uh, report. Uh, First, uh, we have to say that, uh, uh, and we'll see that in uh, the following graphs, uh, um, the situation of uh, uh, road safety of youngsters and children in the European Union in uh, uh, the last decade has uh, improved considerably in uh, uh, all uh, the European countries that are covered by this report. Yet, 809 children and youngsters died in uh, 2020, those under the age of 18. 
And more than 11,000, 11,000, it, 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 it's, it's a figure that we should not even be able to pronounce if you see uh, what happened between 2011 and 2021. And uh, many, many more also have uh, um, sustained um, life-changing injuries. Um, let's see what happened across Europe for uh, uh, this cohort, eight, zero, 17 years old in uh, uh, the last decade. Um, annually, on average, as we saw, as we said, actually, we didn't see, but we said in the previous slide, uh, uh, there has been a reduction of 5.5% uh, uh, on average uh, every year in uh, uh, the countries covered by uh, the report. Um, the best improvement has been done by Norway and uh, Switzerland, and uh, uh, more or less all countries have uh, uh, seen uh, an improvement. One so stagnation and uh, um, unfortunately um, we see an increase in uh, um, Bulgaria that is the um, country on the right hand side of, uh, uh, of the graph. Um, if uh, we uh, divide by uh, age groups you can see that uh, more or less at the age of 14 mortality increases dramatically. Um, actually, 50% uh, of those that were killed in uh, uh, the group we are considering, um, 0 to 18, were, um, well, 0 to 17, where 50% uh, of those were um, killed in uh, the age groups 15, 16, 17. And uh, this is uh, certainly easily explained also by more independent travel. Uh, at a certain age, the choices of travel are not any longer dictated by the parents, children start going out on their own, and uh, also uh, access to um, power to wheelers. For mopeds, the uh, European Union, uh, the directive requires uh, uh, the age of 15 with the possibility to derogate for some countries to the age of 14, some of them have, and then uh, obviously uh, uh, you can see the uh, results of, uh, um, of this. Um, if you look at the uh, improvements per age group, you can see that uh, um, both age groups of the youngsters and the children have uh, uh, reduced uh, their mortality much better than uh, uh, the adult population. And in this graph, you can see also two steep declines. One uh, is uh, uh, due to the crisis, of course, the first one and uh, the economic crisis, the second one to uh, the health crisis with uh, uh, the um, pandemic. Um, road mortality uh, for the 0 0.17 per um, country. Um, unfortunately, children and youngsters do not benefit of the same level of safety everywhere in uh, the European Union. For example, you can see mortality is seven times higher in uh, um, Bulgaria than uh, in Norway. Um, when it comes to um, adults and children, um, we have noted uh, a somewhat strong correlation uh, of safety, which means that uh, uh, the safety of the adult population and divided by countries, more or less similar, the positions are more or less similar for uh, uh, these and uh, the um, uh, children, whereas the correlation is uh, um, not so strong when you compare the adult population with uh, the uh, younger um, population. Um, next graph shows the proportion of those under uh, 18 uh, road deaths among all deaths in uh, um, the uh, European Union. And uh, uh, on average in uh, the EU, after the first birthday, we don't consider those who are still uh, um, less than, uh, than one year old, um, one in 10 deaths, 10% 10 is uh, uh, a road death, which is quite a big uh, proportion. If you look at the adult population, this is 0.4%. Uh, uh, and of course, this also takes into account that obviously adults have uh, uh, diseases, but it's, 
it cannot just be explained by this. It is explained by the increased risk of uh, uh, children and youngsters and by the fact that, uh, uh, and this leads us to say that it is extremely important that uh, measures are um, taken for uh, uh, this group of uh, uh, population. And uh, um, if we just look at uh, uh, the proportion of the, those under 18 road deaths amongst all deaths, uh, again, uh, if we uh, um, divide by, by age group for those uh, uh, under 18, um, we said that for the, the two groups taken together, it was 10%. Well, uh, it is uh, uh, much, much higher after uh, 15 years old when uh, uh, it becomes uh, uh, 18%. Uh, An analysis by uh, um, gender uh, and uh, um, boys uh, under 18 uh, represents uh, two-thirds of all road deaths in this uh, um, age group. And uh, uh, it is an increasingly uh, male problem when the age grows, uh, as soon as children uh, um, get uh, uh, older. And, uh, uh, um, well, this is, uh, uh, don't have much time to uh, uh, go through that because I've got three minutes left, but uh, um, it shows how uh, children and youngsters are killed on uh, uh, the road. And, uh, um, I mean, you, you, you can see some general trends like that. Uh, um, when they are still transported by their parents, they die as car occupants. And then the more and more they grow up, they uh, tend to die as uh, uh, pedestrian cyclists and uh, uh, um, uh, users of uh, um, power two-wheelers. So, and this shows a, a model split between uh, uh, boys and uh, um, girls. Uh, for boys, you can see that as... Uh, of uh, 14, uh, they are increasingly killed as uh, um, users of uh, power to wheelers. For girls that uh, uh, at 16 and 17, they mostly die as car passengers, even though uh, this is not a peculiarity of girls, but it happens also for, uh, um, also for, uh, um, for boys. Um, so this was uh, a, a sneak preview of the data of uh, uh, this uh, uh, publication. Uh, just to say that uh, the Learn Flash uh, uh, will be uh, published uh, in October 2022 on uh, uh, the role of education in reducing deaths among children and youngsters on uh, uh, European roads. However, uh, I also um, bring to your attention the um, publication we're going to launch in September 2022, PIN Flash Report 43 on reducing child deaths on European roads. Uh, of course, the first one is just about children, second one is about children and uh, youngsters, and another important differentiation is that the first one uh, um, will look at the countermeasures more in the framework of a safe system approach. We'll talk about infrastructure, we'll talk about uh, uh, um, uh, uh, enforcement, we'll talk about vehicles, uh, whereas uh, with uh, the Learn Flash, uh, we have uh, deliberately chosen to concentrate on uh, um, education measures. So the two um, publications, in uh, um, a way, will need to uh, be seen as uh, um, complementary to um, one another. Um, that's it for uh, uh, my um, presentation. Thank you uh, very much for uh, um, your attention. And uh, um, now, without uh, further ado, I'm going to give the floor to uh, my colleague uh, uh, Frank Mutze, who will actually have two presentations. The first one uh, will be the uh, LEARN project on improving traffic safety and mobility education in Europe. And then uh, Frank will continue uh, directly on his second uh, presentation, thereby ensuring the transition between uh, part one and uh, part two of uh, uh, the uh, seminar, of today's seminar. And the second presentation will be on uh, um, linking education on uh, sustainable mobility with traffic safety. So I do invite Frank to the floor. Thank you. Good day, everyone here and uh, online. Um, my name is Frank Mutze, and as Antonio said, I uh, manage the Learn Project on Education at the European Transport Safety Council. Um, and while the presentation is being loaded, thank you very much. 
Um, uh, just a quick uh, background to the LEARN project. Uh, next month it will be five um, years ago that we had the very first European Traffic Education Seminar hosted with a VSV uh, in Mechelen. And the response to this um, uh, seminar as well as the feedback provided, the enthusiasm as well as the gaps identified during the seminar led us together with VSV and Foundation Mafra to start the LEARN project in 2018. Um, with the aims to improve the quality of traffic safety and mobility education in Europe through the publication of uh, reports, of which uh, the main ones I'll be presenting um, shortly, and um, as well um, the uh, enhancement of the European Community of Road Safety Education Experts through organization of webinars and seminars like the one uh, of today. Um, but before I do that, uh, I just want to uh, bring to your attention the wonderful expert panel that we have um, who have supported us for the last uh, years um, with the invaluable guidance, with the support, the feedback and input. Um, the expert panel gathers leading experts on this topic from uh, across Europe and uh, I'm very happy that many of them are in the room uh, today. Um, so thank you very much and um, all the reports that I'll be uh, showing today, um, uh, basically they're the real authors of all the recommendations and um, uh, guidance. Uh, one thing that we did at the very beginning um, was uh, discuss what is traffic safety and mobility education, what do we mean with it? And we decided um, that it meant uh, to cover all measures that aim at positively influencing the traffic behavior patterns with an emphasis not only on gaining knowledge uh, and understanding of the traffic rules and developing the imp uh, and improving the skills through training and experience, but to also focus on strengthening and changing um, the attitudes and uh, intrinsic motivations towards um, safe behavior and the safety of other road users to contribute towards a safety-minded culture. And important as well the, to provide the children with the tools necessary for well-informed choice of mobility. Uh, and this is uh, going to be the topic of the second presentation that I'll be giving today. We also limited it to uh, the age group 0 to 17, focusing particularly on primary and secondary education, as this is where most of the um, educational material is created for. However, um, the recommendations uh, and best practices can be uh, reinterpreted and adapted for other age groups as well and not just for primary secondary education but also for, for example, uh, youth organizations that want to contribute to improving um, traffic safety. Antonio just mentioned the status of the road safety situation for children and youngsters and as part of the LEARN project we looked at the status of predominantly the provision of traffic safety and mobility education in Europe. And um, we set out uh, uh, this status in an overview report, the status report, um, that you can download for free from our website. Um, and before I give an overview of the status, uh, highlight key points, I just want to bring to your attention that most of the European states have signed the Vienna Convention on Road Traffic. And they have thereby committed to uh, provide road safety education on a systematic and continuous basis, um, particularly in schools at all levels. So what did we find in our report? Uh, well, firstly, we found that um, traffic safety education in uh, one form or another is given in primary education in all uh, European states. Looking at kindergartens, um, we can see that in se uh, seven out of 10 states, uh, traffic education is provided there as well. And at secondary education in high schools, it's in eight out of 10 states. Uh, only a handful of countries uh, provide it at um, tertiary level as well. Um, these rather positive figures, however, hide the fact that there are significant differences. There are significant differences between the hours provided to children as well as the types of lessons. And these differences are not just between countries. Um, for example, in some countries, children may get uh, road safety education structurally uh, an X amount of time, of an X uh, hours a week, versus uh, just uh, uh, six, seven uh, times in a year. Um, but it's also a difference between levels of education. Um, specifically for um, secondary education, it may be given in 81% of the states, um, but um, the report shows that it's given rather sparsely there. Also with a shift from um, uh, both theoretical and practical lessons at primary education towards uh, more theoretical and uh, secondary education. So the conclusion of the report um, is that uh, uh, in practice the European states UNICE commitment is not always fulfilled and that there is a lot of room for improvement, especially for secondary education 
as uh, this report showed, as well as the importance that Antonio underlined with 50% of the uh, fatalities uh, being youngsters aged 15 to 17 who could benefit from additional education. To improve the traffic safety and mobility education um, in Europe and the, its provision, um, the learn, together with the Learn Expert Panel, we drafted 17 key principles, 17 key recommendations um, to improve uh, traffic safety and mobility education, together with best practice examples that illustrate how um, these key recommendations are implemented in the countries uh, across Europe, predominantly the countries from which the Learn Expert Panel comes. Um, it's the recommendations aimed at national and local decision makers, but uh, also had teachers, uh, teachers and other organizations um, can apply these, uh, especially at schools, um, to already improve uh, the provision of traffic safety education there as well. I will not go into detail in all of these recommendations, especially because some of them will also come back in the second part of my presentation. Um, but just as a quick overview, um, the first group of key principles focus on the right to receive traffic safety and mobility education and includes the recommendation, for example, that um, it should be included in the curriculum for schools at all levels, including uh, educational goal set as well as um, hours uh, uh, of lessons given to pupils. Um, it also includes um, uh, ensuring that there are sufficient resources for schools to implement the uh, education. Um, the second group of key principles then focuses on um, engaging and supporting the schools um, as well as supporting the teachers so that they feel confident and comfortable to give the lessons um, and uh, in addition as well uh, to have a, a teacher appointed as traffic contact teacher who then is the central point of contact uh, for traffic education at that school which has shown if schools have such teacher um, they are um, more inclined to provide road safety education, structurally. Um, I'll quickly skip over the group of key principles on ensuring high quality education, um, then quickly highlighting the ones that facilitate framework conditions, for example, to already train students that are becoming a teacher in um, giving traffic safety education already during their training. Also to have in place measures to follow up um, that the education is given in practice, for example, via school audits or via reward systems, um, as well as including traffic safety education in the education of other subjects, such as, for example, physics. And finally, um, involve all stakeholders. The education is not just the task of the school, but it's a responsibility of um, all relevant stakeholders, uh, municipalities, authorities, as well as parents and the pupils who should be all involved in the education. Then quickly a look at uh, ensuring high quality education recommendations and this includes um, basically that the education should reflect the definition, not just skills and knowledge but also about um, attitudes and motivations as well as training and practice, that um, it should be kept up to date, uh, not only with regards to mobility trends but also with regards to pedagogical development. Um, that quality standards should be used, uh, that um, the material should be tested uh, and evaluated, and that the pupils should be assessed and that they have the opportunity to assess themselves. And why is this group so important? It's because projects that are poorly designed can in effect have uh, an adverse effect. Um, projects that despite the best intentions um, have uh, shown um, uh, there are projects that, despite the best intentions, uh, have shown to uh, negatively influence the behavior. So it's very important that um, these projects are pre-tested and evaluated, especially because schools have a limited budget and limited time, and it's therefore important that the money and time that schools have is spent on well-designed and evaluated projects and measures that have proven to contribute towards um, safe behavior and the safety of children. And this links neatly to the Learn Manual, the publication that we published last year, which is a guidance document um, on for developing and evaluating traffic safety and mobility education activities. Um, and uh, it provides recommendations, guidelines, as well as inspiration for um, the development and evaluation of such material. Um, to show a little bit more specific what it is, uh, firstly, uh, uh, it's the guidelines itself, which sets out the main recommendations and criteria. Basically, it reflects a list of 
things that should be considered um, when developing and evaluating material. And then in the handbook, um, the eight steps of the manual are set out in much greater detail um, with additional thoughts and considerations given, um, as well as links to uh, other material for further reading. And then in the last part of the manual, uh, it shows with best practice examples how the recommendations, guidance and steps from the manual are implemented um, across Europe by the Learn Expert panel members and should provide for inspiration of how that can be done um, for when developing new or updated activities. So for who is the Learn Manual? Uh, first of all, um, it's uh, primarily aimed at the developers of educational material um, as a starting point for creating and updating their activities as a source of inspiration and um, a guidance document with recommendations for what should be considered to be on the right track to um, creating or updating qualitatively sound material. But it's also useful for ministries, authorities, agencies and organizations for when they decide on which proposals for activities to fund. Because as I mentioned, the Learn Manual, the guidelines, they reflect a minimum list of criteria of things that should be considered or given thought to um, for the development of qualitatively sound material. And in a similar vein, uh, schools and organizations can use it for when they decide on which activities um, to buy or use. Then um, the Learn Manual uh, condensed in one minute. Um, so the Learn Manual uh, starts with the analysis of the, um, yeah, and I see uh, laughter, the Learn Manual condensing in one minute is quite a, a challenge, um, but I'm gonna try. <laughs> So um, it's uh, uh, starting off in step one with the analysis of the problem uh, as well as um, uh, um, the analysis of the target age group uh, gathering the data necessary for the um, problem that is to be addressed. Then in step two it's the definition of objectives that are to be achieved with the um, uh, activity and then using um, behavioral change models in step three uh, you gain insights into developing uh, the design of the activity itself. Um, then it's important to pretest the activity uh, in step five uh, and adjust the um, activity if necessary before the actual production in step six and the implementation in step seven. Um, and then finally very important to evaluate the activity in step eight um, in order to make sure that the activity is indeed doing what it is intended to do. Um, it may seem like a linear process, but it's actually an uh, iterative process, meaning that you have to go back and forth between different steps. So for example, the results of the pretest may show you that certain elements of your activity are not working, and you have to go back to a previous step. And similarly, evaluating is not something you should start to think of after you have implemented it, but it's something that should be integral to your design and already be considered when uh, defining the objectives and the design of the project. Um, together with all the learn material, uh, it's available for free to download at trafficsafetyeducation.eu, which is the uh, Learn Project um, website. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll move into the second part of uh, my presentation and also the second session of today's seminar, which, is, uh, which has a theme linking education on sustainable mobility with traffic safety and with my presentation uh, I'll be setting the scene as well as providing the policy recommendations that will be featured in the upcoming uh, Learn Flash report uh, on this specific topic and then we'll have five uh, presentations on projects and measures um, that focus on linking education on sustainable mobility with traffic safety and which are also featured in the report as well. So to quickly go back to the um, uh, definition, um, this uh, part, this flash as well as this session focus very much on highlighting the last um, part of the definition which is to provide children with the tools necessary for a well-informed choice of transport mode, um, looking particularly at sustainable and active mobility. And to provide a policy context, and Jesus had already uh, set out uh, a lot of uh, items this morning referring for example um, to the draft this summer, uh, because countries and cities across Europe are facing interconnected um, challenges. Um, climate change, uh, increasing urbanization, stagnating road deaths, as Antonio previously showed prior to COVID, and um, air pollution and health, other health um, challenges such as uh, obesity. And a shift towards sustainable mobility, and in particular active mobility, walking and cycling, 
um, can play an important role in overcoming many of these challenges. Um, and there are many policy uh, initiatives and measures uh, that are taken at global, regional, national and local level. And I've just highlighted uh, two. Uh, first is the United Nations Sustainable uh, Development Goals, the SDGs, which set out a wide variety of goals and targets, uh, including goals and targets related to good health and well-being, climate action, sustainable cities and communities, and indeed also quality education. And uh, then uh, to highlight one measure at uh, European level, the EU has uh, a new uh, urban mobility framework. Um, which was published last year and which uh, includes a renewed focus on um, active mobility, particularly walking and cycling. And um, in fact, during the stakeholder workshops that were held uh, in preparation of this new framework, the measures that support walking and cycling were regularly among the ones that received the highest support from both citizens and stakeholders. So to link then traffic safety with sustainable mobility, um, real and perceived safety has a uh, profound effect on modal choice, and this is especially true for the most sustainable um, modes of transport, walking and cycling. And um, walking and cycling is also the main focus of um, the session, as well as the main focus of the LEARN report. Um, safer roads are also more sustainable roads. Um, if roads are unsafe, uh, road users might be deterred from using um, walking and cycling as the mode of transport and instead opt for um, less sustainable uh, modes of transport. And safety fears are also a major barrier for the uptake of cycling. Um, a Eurobarometer survey has shown that 73% of uh, European citizens uh, consider road safety to be a serious problem in cities. And uh, last week I came across an editorial uh, in The Guardian uh, with the title, Cycling is so dangerous now, my children have had to stop, which I think perfectly captures this from a personal perspective. And I highly recommend reading this one, but to summarize, um, this uh, teacher's assistant uh, had not, before COVID, uh, gone with her kids to school, would not let her kids um, cycle on the streets because of the danger predominantly from cars. Then with COVID, measures were introduced to have separated bike lanes and um, now she felt safe to go with her kids uh, and go on uh, the bike to school, similar to several other teachers. And then unfortunately this story does not have a happy end because the cycling lanes were taken away again. And as a result, the uh, kids no longer feel safe enough to cycle. And uh, together with other parents, the shift that was gone towards sustainable mobility unfortunately went back to bringing uh, children back to school with the cars. And this underlines, um, I think, very well the importance of road safety for the uptake of um, sustainable mobility. Um, and uh, to talk about the benefits, why promote walking and cycling? It's because it has multiple benefits. Uh, with regards to health, it leads to improved physical and mental health environment. It leads to uh, reduced emissions and pollutions. Um, children, uh, instead of being transported in the back seat, when they walk and cycle, they can become more aware of their surroundings and develop the road safety skills um, they need to become safe adults. And pedestrians and cyclists pose less danger to other road users because they travel at uh, lower speeds as well as have less mass. Unfortunately, they're also uh, more vulnerable. Um, uh, uh, and means that if there is just a mere modal shift uh, from car use to walking and cycling, um, with everything else remaining equal, this risk and increase in road deaths and injuries due to their vulnerability. Nevertheless, um, there are health, the health benefits of walking and cycling do outweigh, in terms of uh, disability adjusted life years, the negative impacts of injuries and deaths. So the main message um, here is um, the key to healthier lives and to safer roads is to encourage walking and cycling while at the same time also introduce new measures to improve and assure the safety of pedestrians and cyclists. And this is also um, the theme of the report, um, because the report does not only look at improving the traffic safety education focused on um, sustainable mobility, um, but it also looks at non-educational measures uh, for improving the safety of walking and cycling uh, around the school in its part three, and uh, also in general in part four. And while these are non-educational um, measures, they're nevertheless prerequisites for children um, 
to walk and cycle in safety and should therefore and have therefore also been included as a very important part in this upcoming Learn Flash report. Um, I'll quickly go over uh, the key recommendations of the first two parts of this report, um, focusing on the education as well as the safety in and around the school. So with regards to um, improving the education on safe and sustainable mobility, um, linking back to the learn definition, the education that kids receive on this topic should not just be theoretical knowledge about how to walk and cycle safely and to learn what the benefits are, but it should also be about developing the skills and promoting the safe and sustainable attitudes and behavior to motivate them uh, when safe to go by foot or by bike. Um, a, a closely linked to this is uh, are the lessons it should not only take place in the classroom, but they should also train uh, in practice uh, in both protected and real world uh, environments if safe, so that the, um, the training is connected to the real world um, problems in the child's environment and adapted also to the role that they have in the traffic system. Um, Important for this education is also the possibility to link it to major issues such as, for example, presenting this material in the context of climate change or, for example, in the context of health. Um, and, uh, in fact, schools could be reluctant to just uh, deliver a specific program on traffic safety and mobility education, but they might be more willing to give such lessons if the material was presented in the context of another theme. So developers of educational material could therefore consider the use of expensive uh, themes um, to make this, uh, these lessons more attractive to the schools. Uh, for example, by linking them to the sustainable uh, development goals. Um, and of course, uh, high quality material is important that quality standards are used, that uh, the uh, expected quality of uh, safe and sustainable mobility education um, is the same as for other subjects in schools, such as uh, language or um, mathematics. Then looking at the recommendations to facilitate education on sustainable uh, mobility. Um, and it's important to create a, a supportive environment. Um, that schools are supported by authorities and encouraged to give the lessons and that the teachers again are um, supported in uh, providing these lessons as well. Um, also important to integrate um, safe and sustainable mobility education in the curriculum um, with both goals as well as lesson hours set. And uh, one recommendation in particular is uh, for um, the cycling tests that are given across Europe to be considered for inclusion in the curriculum because the cycling tests um, check a lot of boxes of the learn key principle. For example, both theoretical and practical education, um, both in the classroom and uh, in practice, it um, also allows pupils uh, to be assessed uh, and therefore uh, authorities could uh, yeah, consider this for inclusion in the curriculum. Um, and also important is to make uh, sufficient resources available. And then in the context of um, cycling, uh, one of the challenges um, that we heard is that there is, uh, when teachers notice that the pupils do not all have a bicycle and therefore there are not enough bicycles to give the lessons, uh, the teachers are uh, not giving the lessons. And instead, um, authorities should ensure the availability of bicycles and helmets at the schools, for example, by providing enough resources for the purchase and storing, or for example, by having a scheme that would allow um, schools to borrow the uh, bicycles in order for these practical lessons, which are very important for children, also to be given. Um, and again, uh, this education is the responsibility for everyone um, not just the schools, and in this particular also for parents who could, as traffic uh, parents, uh, for example, help in the organization of um, the cycling tests that I just mentioned. Um, and then uh, promote... <coughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, promoting uh, safe and active travel to and around schools. So now moving away from the educational measures towards uh, the non-educational measures. Um, one recommendation here is that schools should have a traffic safety and mobility policy, which should not only include um, which lessons the children uh, receive uh, during a year on safe and sustainable mobility, but also includes the development of safe uh, walking and cycling routes to the school, um, which should be done together with the pupils, the parents, as well as the municipalities who often have the power to also implement then the measures to improve the safety in the surroundings. 
um, and that safe and sustainable schools transport um, is considered uh, as part of the policy. For example, for s short school trips, um, the bike bus could be considered, instead of taking a regular bus as mode of transportation for a couple of kilometers, together with other teachers and parents, if it's safe to do so, to instead go with the kids by bike to, for example, a swimming pool for swimming lessons. Um, another important point is moving cars away from school gates. Um, uh, there is a vicious cycle of parents who no longer feel uh, safe to bring the um, kids to school by walking or by cycling and then instead opt to go by car and thereby increase um, uh, the risk uh, to the other ones who go by uh, foot and by car, etc. So uh, moving cars away from school gates helps to improve uh, road safety, uh, improve the air quality as well as uh, generates a better atmosphere around the gate. This can, for example, be done through uh, school streets. As you can see on the picture, uh, this uh, street in front of the school is closed off during the opening and closing hours of the school and uh, motorized uh, traffic and others uh, are banned from entering the street, allowing the kids to, walk, uh, to arrive uh, safely by uh, foot and um, uh, bike uh, right in front of the school. Another uh, thing that uh, should be uh, implemented are 30 kilometer zones um, across the school. Um, uh, a recent uh, study from Edinburgh showed that by implementing the equivalent of a 30 kilometer limit on uh, certain streets around the school has significantly increased the amount of parents that walk and cycle the kids to school. Um, and also access restrictions uh, should be uh, considered especially with regards to heavy duty vehicles with trucks um, to prevent them from uh, driving in the vicinity of the school when these open and close. Uh, and finally, again, encourage uh, parents to walk and cycle to school. Um, for example, uh, projects that focus on getting the parents on their bikes as a first step uh, towards uh, having these parents bring their children to school um, by bike or foot. And as I mentioned, they can play a role as a traffic parent with the help of the practical activities, but also, for example, um, by pointing out towards the schools and municipalities what the unsafe um, traffic situations or um, locations are en route to school. And then finally, um, the last part of the report focuses on the non-educational measures to improve the safety of pedestrians and cyclists, and uh, it gives a, a very uh, large overview of other measures along uh, in line with the safe system approach um, that should be taken to improve the safety of pedestrians and cyclists. And um, I cannot do justice in probably the one minute that I have left for this presentation to go into detail of all these um, recommendation, but just to highlight a few, it's for example with strategic planning to include targets on the safety of vulnerable road users as well as the safety of children already in road safety uh, and mobility strategies. Also to include road safety as an essential component in the development of um, sustainable urban mobility plans, the SUMPs. Um, also to implement measures uh, that focus on infrastructure and speed, um, to implement safe and credible speed limits as well as 30 kilometer zones in areas where uh, a lot of um, vulnerable road users are, uh, which are also supported by traffic calming measures. Um, and the report will also set out recommendations on vehicle safety, focusing predominantly also on um, uh, direct vision for trucks and uh, enforcement uh, of speed limits as well as uh, illegal parking. Um, the report will set this out, will do much more justice than I could in uh, this one minute, but for uh, those who of you already interested, um, the PIN project that Antonio introduced a bit earlier has two reports on this topic, um, PIN flash number 37 on improving um, urban areas, urban safety, and number 38 on improving walking and cycling um, in Europe. And with that, um, it's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you for uh, um, delivering two great, dense presentations and uh, uh, most importantly for um, keeping time uh, uh, perfectly, which I'm sure the other speakers are going to do as well. Uh, we will start with Vangelis Macris from the Road Safety Institute Panos Milonas on uh, uh, promoting walking and cycling through educational interventions, um, the Erasmus program of the Road Safety Institute Panos Milonas. Vangelis, floor is yours. Thank you, thank you Antonio. 
Uh, dear friends, dear colleagues, it's so nice to see you again uh, in person and virtually. And I'm very glad to contribute to this very interesting seminar uh, by showing a, a very concrete example of uh, linking sustainable mobility with uh, traffic safety education. Uh, I'm going to present you today, first of all, some words about uh, our organization, the Road Safety Institute Panos Milonas, and then to uh, currently running uh, Erasmus projects, we are coordinating the moving stars, moving safely to all roads, and the cycling in uh, safety. The one has to do mainly with active mobility of children, and mainly of primary school children, on walking, and the other one on cycling, mainly for youth, uh, for the youngsters. And um, so uh, our institute, Panos Milonas, uh, was established in uh, May 2005 after the unfair loss of Panos Milonas, uh, a 22-year-old student. Uh, back then in 2004, in Greece, we counted uh, more than one and a half thousand uh, people dying on the streets each year, and most of them were young people. So his uh, friends, fellow students, teachers, uh, the motor press, because uh, Panos was not only a student but also uh, uh, um, uh, and also writing in the press, uh, they said this thing must stop. So uh, a petition was made and an institute was born. His uh, mother, Vasiliki Milona, took uh, the lead and created an organization together with other organizations at the Academia that has a vision of a world without road crisis. And uh, our strategy is mainly into three uh, parts. The one is to advocate and also to cooperate with the uh, uh, government in order to introduce uh, uh, measures that uh, save lives. The second, and where we have the most focus of our work, is to improve traffic safety culture by changing the road user behavior, mainly through education, traffic safety and mobility education, and through awareness raising. And also, the third uh, pillar has to do with inter infrastructure, mainly by bringing into the country pilot works in order to get adopted by the state. We are members of uh, various organizations. We are members of the European Transport Safety Council uh, in consultative status with the United Nations, member of the United uh, Nations Road Safety Collaboration, also a national relay uh, for the Road Safety Charter in Greece. And uh, you see that back then in 2004, when Panos died, we had 1,060, 670 fatalities. In 2010 till 2020, this decade, we were uh, actually the only uh, country in the EU that uh, succeeded the reduction of uh, 50 uh, percent. Uh, we had actually 54 percent, and that. Uh, brought to Greece uh, the PIN award uh, in 2020, 2021. Uh, so what we do for traffic safety and mobility education, uh, so far we have uh, educated more than 2,500 uh, 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 students through our uh, um, uh, science-based uh, educational programs for working, for cycling, for adolescents. We are also having a close collaboration with the um, uh, Ministry of Education and we are also coordinating or being members into European projects that have to do with traffic safety. Some of them I'm going to present you in this uh, uh, later. Uh, and we are also uh, have a, put a, a lot of effort into promoting sustainable and active mobility in Greece by supporting municipalities and cities during the European Mobility Weeks uh, with a lot of uh, training and awareness raising uh, campaigns through the National Road Safety Weeks and of course throughout the years in terms of the sustainable urban mobility initiatives that each uh, country takes, uh, the city takes. Uh, we promote the cycling culture uh, in uh, safe uh, and safe cycling behavior with cycling info points. The one you see is uh, in uh, the municipality of Athens. Down is something that is happening right now in Thessaloniki uh, International Fair, the 26th, and actually it's the 
86th uh, fair, but for the first time we have road safety addressed and cycling, uh, a cycling circuit uh, installed and uh, having uh, trainings uh, to schools and to citizens. Uh, awareness raising uh, video spots. Uh, also, we are the recent years uh, uh, interested into the personal mobility devices. Uh, we have a student contest on digital creation for road safety in collaboration with the Department of Radio Television um, of the Ministry of Education. This year we had it all dedicated to cycling. Last year was uh, the fourth for, and we linked it with the international campaign This Is My Street that helps uh, young people to advocate for safer roads, for more active uh, and sustainable uh, travels. And also the third was uh, linking it with the sustainable development uh, goals and especially the third and the sixth goal that has to do with traffic safety and uh, sustainable mobility. And also as uh, members of uh, FIA, we, uh, have, uh, we got involved into promoting uh, uh, international campaigns uh, like the uh, Streets for Life for the promotion of the Decade of Action. Uh, we translated the global plan and we distributed it to ministries and to municipalities and you know that this, uh, in this global plan we have the pillar of uh, sustainable mobility of um, uh, intermodal uh, transport and uh, also we had coordinated the Lab 30, the, uh, This is my street, also for Greeks uh, and Cyprus. And now we go to the uh, uh, main part of the presentation to the uh, uh, to uh, the Erasmus projects we are coordinating, the move, Moving Stars, that comes from the acronym Moving Safely to All Roads. Uh, we have uh, seven partners from uh, five countries, three schools, two primary schools, one in Ireland, in uh, the town of Kildar, uh, here in Spain at Barcelona, in Terrassa, and also a Greek minority school in Istanbul, uh, in Turkey. Uh, it is a high school. Uh, also, we have uh, the, another road safety institute, the Institute of Transport of uh, uh, Poland in uh, Warsaw. And uh, here in, in Greece, uh, we have also Omega Technology, that is the digital developer that had developed the digital tools of uh, the project, and also Indify, an organization that has to do with the evaluation and the validation of the project. So the idea of this uh, project is to combine the traditional movement, uh, moving games that children play in the yards with uh, innovative digital application, video games, also web tools, with traffic safety education in order to develop new activities that will be available for the teachers. It's a school education uh, program, Erasmus program, supported by the EU through the Erasmus uh, program, and the key action is on school education. Um, Frank asked me to link this with a manual, and I can say to you that since the proposal, because we had this privilege to be in the uh, expert panel, we, uh, we were reading the manual, and also the proposal, and then the implementation, we were following the, uh, the manual of the LEARN. And I think that the uh, if someone is hearing us now and uh, wants to submit proposals or run projects, they should follow the manual of the LEARN. It is uh, uh, the, the key for success. So first we go to analyze. And what we see about the children mobility nowadays, some of them were mentioned in the presentations before, that compared to previous uh, generations, children nowadays are less active in both and mobility, have lower participation rates in active transport, walking and cycling without adult accompaniment into the journeys to school and other local destination. And also most of the time is spent indoors through in the TV and playing uh, electronic entertainment media. Uh, less of them are engaged into sports, uh, developing the motor skills, and, uh, uh, and less, more or less, have uh, fulfilled the recommendation for one hour of moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity. And uh, uh, parents are afraid to take their, uh, their, their um, children walking and cycling to school, 
car dominate environments, the traffic dangers, the perceived uh, by parents, the fear of criminality, and their choice to choose the car to bring them to school. This has implications, first of all, in the health of the children. Uh, the number of children and adolescents who are obese has increased tenfold since the mid-70s. Uh, other communicable, non-communicable diseases and also implications into movement, into movement coordination and the relevant skills that are essential for active uh, transport, for uh, walking and, and uh, uh, cycling and also this that we also mentioned in the manual that children who are not allowed to gain real experience in the streets do not gain also the uh, skills and the abilities needed for uh, moving safely into the roads. And also we we'll know from the ETC report uh, uh, of the status of traffic safety education that is not uh, uh, received uh, into a a stable way, not as a dedicated uh, uh, lesson, and teachers also are not adequately trained. We had this uh, from the uh, 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 literature, and we also made uh, an assessment, some local surveys. Uh, we sent uh, uh, um, a questionnaire to 91 teachers, mainly from Greece, Ireland, and uh, Poland, and Spain, and uh, they stated, the 71% stated that uh, uh, students travel every day to school accompanied by their parents and mainly by car, uh, that they dedicate throughout the year one to five hours for traffic safety and mobility education. The majority has never attended a seminar on how to teach traffic safety in class and uh, they state that they're somewhat uh, confident to teach. But what was more uh, interesting is that uh, we asked them if they had seen after the lockdowns some increase into difficulties in their children in the yard or in the class on uh, moving, on coordination, on stability or other. And 33% answered that yes we have noticed and 15% of them said that they have noticed also an increase of students getting injured in related accidents in, that has to do with balance, with stability, uh, like falls, uh, traffic uh, incidents uh, after the lockdowns. Well, we are not claiming that this is uh, um, a survey that uh, can be generated and uh, validated, but it gives us some insights about what is happening after the lockdown because we saw in the previous presentation that we have a fall into uh, traffic uh, injuries and uh, fatalities into children but what happens next? We had the children uh, locked down uh, into four walls uh, attending the classes, not playing in the yard, not playing with their friends uh, in the, in the uh, neighborhood, in the gym. Uh, so what has to do this what are the implications in their uh, skills and to the mobility? Okay. Um, so, uh, we uh, found that now we go to the second, that we uh, wanted to make a project that was addressed as a main group, the target group one, the teachers, to update their skills and knowledge on traffic safety to receive training tools and resources and material to increase their knowledge on traffic safety education and also to create partnership because this is the idea of Erasmus, exchanging best practices and creating part, uh, partnerships around Europe. And then the second target group was the students to uh, master the movement skills that are needed for uh, safe mobility, active mobility to gain knowledge and understand traffic rules and situations, to promote a safe-minded behavior, some boring words from the, uh, uh, the, from, from the LEARN project, and also as a long-term objective to reduce uh, the number of children who are injured and killed in road crashes, and also to promote active transport uh, for children and reduce the number of children traveling to school by car. And uh, why we choose the uh, movement-based uh, uh, teaching, because uh, I borrow this from the Ministry of uh, Singapore, from the curriculum, because we did a literature review, that 
motor skills development doesn't don't have to do only to gain uh, and master the motor skills, but also has to do with safety awareness and to health and fitness, the, the personal health. And how do children learn and develop these skills? By playing. So we, uh, there are many theories that stress into movement uh, and uh, based learning, into game-based learning. And uh, we had this pedagogical framework and uh, we were ready to design the curriculum development. So we collected best practices from around Europe and also we developed new activities and we developed around 70 games for implementing traffic safety and mobility education. Movement games, movement kinetic motor games playing in the yard, traffic safety games like uh, board games, uh, experiments uh, using uh, web tools and also mixed games that have to do movement uh, and game based activities that have to do with motion and uh, traffic safety. We uh, did the pre-testing into training activities in Greece, in Spain, in Terrassa, at the school and in Kildare in Ireland. Uh, and we uh, played, it was the fun part this, and uh, we pre-tested the activities and then the teachers had to complete an, uh, a questionnaire about how did they found its activity in order to adjust it. So we have the fifth uh, stage of the pre-testing. And finally, we, ad we adjusted the activities and we produced a manual, a teacher's manual that has to do uh, uh, with uh, more than 70 um, uh, uh, activities, games and plays and uh, they will be translated also. It will be, the English version will be out in September and uh, uh, we are also currently translating into Greek, into Polish and into Spanish. Also we provide as an annex and as printed material uh, the resources to play, uh, flashcards, uh, activity sheets, training mats, board games and uh, the innovative part of this project is the uh, Moving Stars video game that is uh, uh, actually a running game but we use a sensory motor camera that detects the motion so the children are not using you know joysticks to play uh, uh, and move but they uh, move the avatar, they control the avatar through their uh, body, through uh, their motion. We have two scenarios on walking, uh, they have also to see the traffic signs into snow, into slippery um, uh, surface and also one for the bike that they learn how to do the signals uh, of the bicycle and control the avatar. It's also COVID free because they don't touch anything, uh, they are just moving and uh, then uh, after we produce the material we go to the dissemination level, to the implementation. Uh, this start Toolkit will be, we are currently creating a network of 100 pilot schools in Greece, Ireland, Poland, Spain and Turkey. Uh, teachers that uh, are uh, attending can register to become one of the 100 schools and these schools can transform their school into a star hubs. They will do the activities there and then they will invite parents, uh, students and play and also talk about uh, active mobility and uh, the implementation of the activities then will help us, the teachers that will do the activities, to evaluate it. We had uh, in Larissa uh, the first star hubs uh, in, uh, it is a city very active into uh, active uh, sustainable mobility so at the traffic park we created a set of workstations like a, a star hub that can be. Uh, we had the training mat on motor uh, skills development, activities, the video game, the board game, we printed it into a giga board game, a walk to the park, uh, cycling safety from our pro program on cycling and also the virtual reality goggles that this is from another Erasmus project that uh, you can find the uh, scenarios and uh, also we had the parents info point in order to uh, introduce parents into the uh, activities and to uh, safety, safety mobility of children. Uh, uh, we had also the Night Eugene, our road safety hero, and we also had to get involved into 
the campaigns, it was on May when we had the Streets for Life campaign for the Decade of Action, get uh, uh, the teachers involved. We had a multiplier event with young teachers studying mainly, most of them, in the University of, uh, uh, of uh, Barcelona. We had also guest organizations, the RSI Ireland, the traffic service of uh, Barcelona. We visited the cycling park of uh, Montjuic in Barcelona. And we also had the traffic police and the municipality urban mobility unit to talk about their sustainable mobility policies and uh, how they uh, promote cycling and uh, walking and I'm going to be uh, very quick on cycling and safety. It's another project that has to do with young people for youth and we have, uh, this is not creating uh, producing material but it's mainly uh, uh, seminars, uh, mobilities. We have uh, six organizations from Greece, uh, Romania, Norway, Netherlands, Iceland and Ireland. We did two train the trainers in uh, activities into uh, Netherlands and to trick traffic in Norway. Uh, we saw what are the best practices in this advanced uh, countries in cycling, safety and cycling uh, um, culture. And then we're going to organize two training events in Greece and Romania, in countries that are a, low, a bit behind into uh, cycling culture. Uh, these youth training events will help uh, to young people to uh, master the cycling skills, to gain knowledge and safe awareness, adopt a sustainable and healthy lifestyle to promote active traveling, improve and reinforce their participation in social matters to demand safer streets, to demand cycle lanes in their, uh, and safer streets into their uh, cities. We're going to have theoretical training and experiential training the first two days, then a cultural cycling to move around the city to see what are the problems, what, are, what is uh, missing, what is uh, uh, to observe the cycling behavior and also the other uh, uh, road users' interaction with cyclists, and then at the final day to develop a road safety campaign that either has to do with awareness raising or advocacy campaign to demand more uh, safer cycling routes in their cities. So, uh, going to the conclusions, uh, if you want to make a successful project, follow the learned principles and the manual methodology. Try to involve everyone into your project, especially into a project that has to do with linking sustainable mobility. Students, teachers, parents, local community, keep your school, your organization open to everyone and into change, and mainly focus into parents to understand that using their car is a vicious cycle and uh, show them the other way of moving. Open their minds, as this is the logo of Erasmus, opening minds, changing lives, and also open the minds into teachers. This is why we have the mobility, to see, we, we, we have to make the teachers to see what is happening to other countries, to advanced countries, not only into traffic safety, but into sustainable mobility, to show other ways of moving, of going to, to school. And this, they have to share it with their children and to instill this uh, mobility and uh, the sustainable development goals that are linked with equity in the roads, with the respect of the vulnerable and to the respect of uh, environment, all these values to be instilled into the children because these are the future uh, road users and these are that the road users that will inherit the transport system that our choices are making today. That's why we have to start from school from the teachers, from the students, and from the parents. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, um, uh, just a note for uh, um, the audience today, uh, the one in person and the one online, uh, all the presentations will be um, available on uh, uh, the LEARN uh, website. Um, happy to give the floor now to Alana Real from uh, uh, PRP, Prevenção Rodoviária Portuguesa, on uh, science education for a safer and more sustainable future. Alana. The one down. The one down. Thank you very much, Antonio. Good morning, everybody. 
and thank you for the opportunity to share with you the project that I'm really satisfying that to implement and develop. This is a project that we prepared during the pandemic period, um, was submitted to the Horizon 2020, uh, and among more than 100 uh, proposals, uh, 10 uh, went for the second stage of approval and three were funded. One was this project. So the uh, work that we did was actually um, good, at least in the eyes of the Commission. Um, the co uh, we call it Partnership for Science Education. The, the um, project involved four countries, Portugal, Greece, Cyprus and Poland. We have um, 10 partners, uh, university research centers, uh, public, health, uh, uh, public health organizations, and uh, or related with public health challenges like PRP with road traffic accidents and uh, a technology institute. Um, the main goals of the projects is to create regional F education clusters um, of schools based in partnerships with the community, with university, research centers, with museums and so on, actually a large community, to enhance also the levels of the scientific literacy and prepare the community and local communities to, adapt, to address the public health challenges. Also to increase students' interests in STEM, science, technology, engineering and maths disciplines and health related professions. Engage students in project-based learning and inquiry-based learning also. Um, we will make the link during my presentation with all these goals. Uh, provide also an inclusive educational environment supported by a web platform for collaboration and dissemination of the teaching learning experience and educational resources and to guarantee the sustainability of the project um, behind the lifetime of the project and also to have impact in the students' interests, competencies and choice related to science and curricula uh, and careers. So, just to give an overview, a brief overview of the project, of course, the standard work package, uh, the project management, but the second work package is related with the design uh, and development of digital educational uh, resources and also scenarios that we, we call it digital education environments. Uh, we will develop resources and we develop all the evaluation and assessment tools. Um, we have uh, another, work package, another work package that is devoted to the enactment and, if, and, and the refinement of the educational scenarios, of course involving also the learning objects, uh, uh, educational resources. Um, another work package that uh, um, is the goal is to prepare teachers to implement these scenarios um, in, in, in school uh, activities, uh, prepare them um, through the scenarios and uh, prepare them to use the materials that we will produce during the, during the project. Um, we have another one that is uh, related with the sustainability of the, networking, uh, of the networks that the schools will establish in the local communities. And the other ones are the traditional ones, the project evaluation and quality assurance, communication, dissemination and ethics requirements. So, just we are in the, by the end of the first year of the project, what we did in the last year was to develop the educational scenarios, um, to develop the learning objects, what are all digital ones, and we have digital educational resources. Uh, the difference is with some one, one of them, the DLOs are uh, interactive, the other ones are to support and complement the DLOs. And we also develop, we develop this and also the assessment tools for the three things, scenarios, learning objects, the, the learning objects and educational resources. The second year, we will focus on the development of workshops um, for teachers uh, and also we'll have a pilot and scale up this pilot to a, a regional level and this will be assessed, uh, the, the workshops and also the implementation of the scenarios. Um, we, and we will be use the evaluation for the refinement of the, all the, the, the materials that we produce and all the, 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 learn, the teaching learning sequence that we also developed. On the third year, on the third year we'll be devoted to the large-scale dissemination where, where we will develop a lot of workshops, uh, webinars mainly. So, 
PRP developed three scenarios, one concerning sustainable mobility, another one crash risk factors, another one related with a public health issue and challenge that is related with traffic accidents. The concepts that are related with these scenarios, they all follow these following principles. It is all, all them are based on science approach. So it's all the learning are related with science. That's the main, uh, the main issue, the main topic. Uh, we also have inquiry-based learning and project-based learning, uh, concepts involving the scenarios, a open schooling. You will understand this, what, will you understand this more in detail when I present you the scenario. And uh, these resources that we'll produce will be open source, so anyone can use it. You'll be in English and in the native language of the country that produced the, the materials. And the assessments, we, all, we have assessments and outcome assessments uh, based on knowledge, attitudes and behaviours, uh, based on the planet, on the theory of planet behaviour, and also an evaluation concerning the intention of following science careers by the students. Um, and we also have a process assessment teaching learning sequence. So, taking into account what is also uh, very explicit in the Learn Manual, uh, all the scenarios and all the sessions were developed taking into account the 5E model, uh, of course, to engage the students in the topic, to make them explore the activities, uh, make them produce what they learn, and also go deeper in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the knowledge and the content that they are engaged with. And also, uh, it will, all the sessions will be evaluated concerning the topic they, ex they, they, they explore. So, just to have an overview about the structure of the scenarios, uh, each structure has a context, of course, a science content that is relevant for the public health education, um, as a subject, as a specific target, have a, a duration, estimated duration, all the requirements that are needed uh, for the implementation of the scenario, have a glossary, indicative literature, and have uh, the goals that we want, we want to achieve with the competencies, learning goals, outcomes, with the knowledge, beliefs, skills, attitudes, and behaviors. We also have all the materials that we use to assess the learning scenario and the sequence of the, of the learning, uh, of teaching learning. We have the contents uh, that are in the um, in the scenario, the digital uh, learning objects and the educational resources that teacher will need to implement the scenario. Um, and we have a sequence of sessions to achieve the goals that we define in the beginning. And all the scenarios as two things. They have a school research project that, of course, is based with inquiry-based learning um, and an open school event. This means that by the end, students will present the results of the, not just what they learned, but what, what they did in the project to the open, uh, an open event, the community, and to the old stakeholders uh, and uh, relevant players uh, uh, concerning the topic. This is the general concept of the scenario. So, concerning um, the scenarios that PRP develop, they're related with sustainable mobility. There is this kind of uh, contents there, the sustainable mobility, the environmental protection and social and economic dimension, eco-mobility, quality of life and road safety. This means that we will um, address um, topics. Uh, the, the students will have the opportunity to explore um, content related with sustainable mobility, related with uh, the impacts of their choices, advantages and disadvantages of their choices, concerning energy, concerning safety, concerning the environment, and so on. And the sustainable mobility uh, scenario, by the end, as a research project that is to uh, c characterize the mobility patterns of the school community. Concerning road traffic crash risk factors, um, we focus on the crash risk factors, uh, the topics with speed, safety equipment, distraction, fatigue, driving and the influence. Uh, they are also related just with science, I'll explain just in a minute. Um, and the school project that is related, it's with a survey that's about opinions, attitudes and behaviors of the school community, students, parents and uh, also teachers. The last one um, is concerning 
the big issue, the public health issue related with the road traffic accidents, and uh, it's more related with indicators, with statistics, and why it is a public uh, uh, issue, and will be related with, with, with data, exploring data, sources of information, and so on, and also has a project involved that they will develop, that will be roadside observ observations around schools, they will choose what kind of observations, we will guide them uh, for some of them, like uh, e protective equipments, or um, zebra cross uh, rates uh, and so on, traffic lights, uh, compliance and other ones. Just to give an idea about this, as I said, it's related with science, uh, all the scenarios. I just give an idea, the, the, the idea that I want to give, I don't go <laughs> on deep uh, with this, I just give an idea that it's related with science that we means that the concepts uh, related to sustainable or road safety, uh, whatever, will be all the contents will be related with science, and the idea was to pick up a main discipline that uh, will work as a coordinator or a leading of the process of the implementation of these scenarios. So the sustainable bill will be related with social science and more biology, uh, and will be implemented in the eight, nine grades. Uh, the road traffic crash risk status will be implemented in the nine grade, and it will be actually physics. Uh, movements, forces, kinetic energy, energy dissipation, and so on. And the other one, road traffic crashes, is more related with maths, uh, that they will explore and will understand how uh, big is the problem concerning road traffic, exploring means, probabilities, uh, make some graphs, and so on, and also exploring road safety, uh, uh, the, um, the roadside observations in an uh, inquiry-based learning perspective. So, just to give you an idea about other scenarios, because this, we are talking about public health issues, the project also address sustainable development goals, uh, non-communicable diseases, healthy eating, how vaccines are developed, or uh, the, mathematical, the mathematic, mathematical representation of any pandemic. Uh, so we have, uh, until now, 24 scenarios developed uh, related with public health issues. Just to give an idea about the, co the, the learning objects that we developed, uh, develop, we tried to develop diverse learning objects uh, uh, during, during the project. We have here the pillars of sustainable mobility. It was an interactive infographic with more information um, uh, added to, to, to each topic. Uh, they can explore. We have a back level simulator and based with the Inmark formula that uh, already, already is developed. Uh, we have a um, runover simulator where they can explore stop distance, reaction distance, and so on. Um, playing with different variables with reaction times, uh, the distance uh, concerning the pedestrian, uh, weather conditions, and so on. And all these are related with physics and, and, and concepts of physics. Um, the visual field um, and the impact of speed in the visual field. We have drag and drop um, uh, activities uh, and much more just as an example and just to give you an idea that is diverse and uh, diverse uh, um, activities that we develop. Uh, as an open source, uh, we develop two platforms. One platform will be the Photo Dentro Paths. It will be the repository, the repository of all learning objects and educational resources. It will be an open source. Anyone can use it. Anyone can download it. And we have another one that is an um, EME platform that is a collaborative platform that allows uh, teachers and students to interact uh, with each other with, uh, for instance, we can create a classroom, we can give some activities to, to, to students to do. Um, we can also create specific learning objects in an easy way. Uh, so it will be open, it will be free for everyone, it will be uh, uh, at the disposal of uh, everyone, any country, in English and in the native language of the countries that are participating. To finish, um, the workshops, of course, the workshops I mentioned will be to prepare teachers to implement these scenarios and to have some experience with the learning objects. So we have, um, of course, uh, a presentation of the, the PATHS project. Uh, we'll talk about the philosophy of the learning scenarios. This means 
of who since uh, raised the awareness about the importance of the inquiry-based learning and project-based learning. Um, we'll present also the platforms, the photo of the anthropophs and EMI, uh, making them aware of the, all the, the potentials of the, these web platforms, making them aware of the road accidents uh, concerning uh, young people, explaining how the scenario was developed and how, uh, and how, how should be implemented, uh, make some uh, experience with the DLO, giving some ideas to explore the, the, the learning objects and the educational resources, making that how to implement the research projects and also give him some highlights about project management. So, um, with this, we hope to improve sustainable mobility, improve road safety, increase the number of students that will follow science careers and with that have persons in the future taking decisions on an evidence-based and not in opinions, not in feelings, but with evidence-based, and um, make also uh, raise the awareness about the communities and give them some knowledge, some tools to act at local level. This means think global, act local, act local um, in the community, giving them all the support um, to implementation of these scenarios. And that's all. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. One minute. Thank you very much, Alan, and uh, uh, thanks to all of you. Now, uh, I wanted to say that there will be an opportunity to ask questions to both Vangelis and Alan. We will do that in uh, uh, the discussion and Q&A at uh, the end of this part two. Um, end of part two, which will be after the coffee break, which we're going to start now. And uh, um, I suggest that uh, we start again at 12.05 uh, Madrid uh, time. So, see you soon. Bye-bye. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, here in the room and uh, uh, online. Uh, we start um, with the um, second uh, uh, part of this part two on uh, um, linking education on uh, uh, sustainable mobility with traffic safety. Um, we now have uh, three um, presentations uh, and uh, um, we will then conclude the morning session with uh, a discussion and uh, um, some uh, questions uh, and answers to this. And it's extremely important that I remind you that uh, you can uh, um, certainly also ask uh, um, questions online. Our colleagues will uh, uh, then uh, um, send them to me and uh, um, I will be able to ask them to uh, the speakers. Um, so um, the next uh, um, speaker was unfortunately not able to join us in Madrid, but uh, um, uh, the presentation will be uh, uh, online. And I'm uh, delighted to give the floor to Vibeke uh, uh, Milch from uh, uh, Toy in uh, um, Norway on uh, the uh, evaluation of the Heart Zone project. Hello. <coughs> Thank you for that nice introduction. So I'm Vibi Kmish. I, I work at the Institute of Transport Economics in Oslo. And today I would like to share some interesting findings from a project that we've conducted in uh, 2021, the evaluation of the Heart Zone project in Bergen municipality. Now, before I dive into the details, I would like to give you some uh, background information. Let's see. I hope I change the slide here. So a growing trend that we see in Norway is that parents are increasingly driving their kids to school. And recent numbers also indicate that one out of three children are driven to school. And why is this a problem, you may ask? Well, increased traffic volume and congestion around the school premises make traveling to school less safe for children who are walking and cycling. And also parents are more hesitant of letting their kids walk and cycle to school. So in many ways, it sort of has a negative spiraling effect. Um, the heart zone traffic safety measure uh, emerged as a sort of response to this trend. And uh, the concept involves uh, defining a sort of zone, a geographical zone, uh, in which uh, car driving is either prohibited or strongly restricted, the hard zone. And 
the notion is that by reducing the traffic volume around the school, you also reduce uh, the traffic exposure and thus walking and cycling and other active forms of mobility becomes safer. And in this study, we regard hard zone as a cultural uh, influencing measure because the objective initially is to influence the behavior and the culture within a limited geographical area. So what are the constituent elements of a hard zone? Well, there's no single recipe really. So the concept is, uh, is dynamic in the sense that it must be adapted to the traffic environment and the different sort of needs and possibilities that exist at each school. But broadly speaking, we can say that hard zone uh, is made up of a combination of several elements. There are awareness raising measures um, and also simple measures uh, aimed at improving infrastructure or the physical environment around school. Uh, but perhaps more, most importantly, it is, uh, it should be regarded as a continuous process. It's not just about the implementation, but it is about the continuous work and following up the project, sort of keeping it alive. And here you can see some example from uh, measures that have been uh, implemented as a part of hard zone in Bergen and common measures are, for example, the establishment of drop zones where parents are encouraged to drop off or pick up their kids, usually located um, outside of the hard zone border. And you also have, for instance, a sign or road markings indicating where the hard zone is. And to the right here in the picture, you can also see an example of hard zone art made by pupils. It also signalizes that you're in the hard zone. Uh, and common uh, aware racing measures include, for example, information about what the hard zone is and where it is located, information uh, encouraging uh, parents to drive uh, less or maybe cycle and walk more, it could be the establishment of walking groups uh, or competitions even to promote walking and cycling among the school children. And also, for instance, sanctioning of unnecessary driving within the area of the hard zone. So the hard zone project in Bergen started in 2018. And it was actually the first municipality in Norway to introduce a concept at the municipality level. And the project was politically initiated through a bylaw stating that all the municipalities, uh, 66 elementary schools, uh, were required to establish a heart zone. And this is a quite different approach to prior heart zone initiatives in Norway that uh, typically have been more bottom up. Now here you can see uh, the sort of organizational landscape uh, of the Heart Zone. So the Heart Zone project involves quite a lot of different agencies and bodies, both within and outside of the municipality. And, uh, and you see this main actors. This is a sort of simplification, but I would like to just, just to get a sense of the, the organizational landscape. So you have the project group that was provided with the task of rolling out the concept to and also uh, support the schools. And then you have the steering group on top there and they are overseeing the process. And then you have the school management and they are sort of the, the central actor here. They are responsible for operationalizing and also actualizing the heart zone project, making it alive. And they also collaborate with parents uh, at various arenas, parental committee arenas, for instance. And you also have the pupils are involved through the student council. And you also have other agencies within the municipality that are either uh, involved in the project or needs to be informed. 
And additionally, you also have other actors outside of the municipality, such as road owners. Now, at the bottom here, you have the target group, and that's uh, the, the people that you're trying to get to and influence, and that, that uh, consists of parents, the school children, and others that also might be passing through the heart zone uh, on a daily basis. So um, the current study can best be described as uh, a process evaluation. And we've been particularly interested in the implementation process here and how the initiative is understood by different actor and, and also how it sort of translates through this system of actors. And uh, we had four aims for this study. So the first one was to map experiences from project group and the steering group. The second was to map the organization of the project at different schools. This, uh, the third one was to map factors that promote and inhibit implementation. And the fourth was to discuss challenges and areas of improvement. Uh, so in order to answer these questions, we conducted focus group interviews and personal interviews with members of the project management, uh, the project management that's being members of the project group and the steering group. And in addition, we also conducted focus group interviews and personal interviews uh, at six different schools with headmasters and uh, members of the school management and parent representatives and also representatives from the school council. And in addition to this, we also conducted a survey for uh, including parents and school employees at four additional schools. And in that survey, we asked, uh, we mapped a number of topics, but uh, among others are the mobility habits before and after the implementation of the heart zone measure. Uh, the implementation process, traffic culture and change in traffic culture, and also the perceived effect uh, of heart zone. So, as I mentioned earlier, the heart zone project in Bergen was politically initiated, and we find that there are pros and cons to this. Uh, a clear advantage is that it resulted in uh, a formal anchoring in the school management and also a broad anchoring in, um, in the different agencies in the municipality. Uh, but some informants in the school management felt that the work was assigned to them um, from higher up in the chain, like many other tasks they are um, assigned. And, um, as such, we found that the local ownership to the project varied um, between the schools. Um, but one of the great advantages uh, to this approach taken in Bergen is that they were able to involve um, the different agencies within the municipality and also integrate Heart Zone as a part of the formal municipality documents, the area plan. And so whenever a new school is built in Bergen, uh, heart zone must be accounted for in the planning. So there have been systemic effects from this project. So moving on to some of the perceived results, there were some variations between schools with regard to perceived results. So we see um, there were several parents and employees who reported positive effects, for instance, that they experienced decreased awareness of traffic safety and driving culture, and uh, that more children were walking and cycling, and also less traffic chaos. But some schools also reported few or no changes at all. And this has probably to do with the fact that in some schools, existing infrastructure and also pre-existing traffic safety challenges posed barriers for finding good solutions. For example, finding designated areas that could be used as drop zones was challenging because some schools have limited space, really. Um, and uh, a, a consequence to that is that most uh, that some schools felt that they were unable to find good solutions and that they simply just moved the problem to other areas 
in the school area, so without really solving the problem. Um, another challenge was maintaining continuity to the hard zone work, which is largely due to the pandemic. So uh, employees had reduced capacity to follow up the project. So that was also a challenge that we found. So I'll move to the survey results. And we had 220 parents from four different schools responding to the survey. And with regard to self-reported um, change in mobility habits, we find that most respondents travel as they did. However, we do see that 14% report driving less frequently, and also 18% report cycling and walking more. So we were curious about whether hard zone can influence the traffic culture. And we operationalize traffic culture as descriptive norms. And there are a set of statements uh, about what other parents do in the hard zones. So for instance, other parents are using the drop zones. Other parents are more attentive to school children when driving. Other children are walking or cycling when they are escorting their kids to school. Uh, and overall, we see that um, respondents generally score high on these statements. So it is indicative to that these behaviors have become more common. Uh, and what facilitates change in traffic culture? Uh, we measure traffic culture by asking respondents whether hard zone had resulted in less driving and whether more children are walking and cycling after the implementation of hard zone. And uh, we performed also a regressional analysis to investigate what factors facilitate change in traffic culture. And what we found was that the implementation of hard zone measures, more specifically walking groups, drop zones, and the sanctioning of unnecessary driving in, hard, in the hard zone uh, is the factor that explains the greatest portion of variance in traffic uh, culture. Moreover, we also see that a high level of anchoring in the school management is important for successful implementation. So anchoring and implementation, they go hand in hand. I think I need to skip this. So I'll just head on to the conclusions. So um, to conclude, a hard zone appears to be an effective measure to reduce driving and improving road safety around schools. Uh, however, broad implementation at the municipality level is complex because schools have generally very different traffic environment and very different needs. And they also have different opportunities to tailor the concepts to their needs. So one size does not necessarily fit all. And uh, we also see that strong anchoring in the school management is important. And finally, anchoring and implementation appear to be the most effective components in terms of traffic culture change. So that was very, very short on our project. Uh, I will also provide you with a link to the report. It's unfortunately written in Norwegian, but there is uh, a summary in English. So for all of you who are interesting, interested, there it is. And thank you so much for the attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Vibeke. That's uh, very much appreciated and uh, um, very um, interesting. Uh, I know Vibeke will stay with us uh, because there may be um, questions later during the um, Q&A session. Um, uh, now, without hesitation, the uh, uh, floor to Maria Jose Aparicio, who is uh, at the DGT, and uh, um, she will uh, uh, talk about the new Spanish educational regulations on uh, safe mobility. Uh, good morning. Thank you, MAFRE, and thank you, thank you, European Transport Safety Council, for this seminar. Um, I'm going to take in, a, in advance that we have simul simultaneous translation to speak in my maternal languages. Sorry, uh, we <laughs> it's not always like that. Uh, 
Voy a hablar de la nueva regulación española en materia de vial. New Spanish educational regulations on safe mobility. Safety is one of the most important parts of the national strategy for road safety, and this strategy includes nine strategic lines. And the first one is people that should be trained and able. Each of these strategic lines includes a series of specific actions, and within the biannual action plan 22 to 23. We include those that I will now explain. I'm going to talk about four only because the measures that are being promoted at all levels of the administration and civil society are many, and I'm going to focus on those that specifically have to do with road safety, uh, tra uh, education. Road edu safety education in our country, and as has been said before, and this is similar in other countries of Europe, was in the school curriculum, but in a transverse, so to speak, way. What does that mean? Well, it was uh, considered necessary in all schools, but it was not associated to any specific subjects, no specific stages of learning. So it very much depended on the will of each school, the existence of personnel, teachers, contact with associations, victims' associations, foundations, or local councils that wanted to promote safety in the schools. Now the new education law includes specific goals as regards road safety, education. Um, the, my talk today might be a bit uh, tedious because uh, I'm going to use uh, legal terminology and refer to the laws, but I'm going to try to summarize this so that you understand the great step ahead we've taken. The law includes specific objectives in all ages from uh, preschool children, zero to six years of age, up until secondary education, 18 year olds that finish school. And it's been included in what we call the organic law and those goals have been uh, translated into what we call royal decrees which develop the contents for children's education, primary, secondary and uh, higher education. The education law, and this has been referred to this morning by our colleagues at the ETSC, doesn't speak about knowledge, theoretical contents, it talks about competencies. What we want is for children when they finish school, they should know how to face life with a series of basic competencies. Competencies, digital competencies, communication skills, linguistic skills, or citizenship skills. They should be sustainable, they should be uh, environmentally conscious, etc. Within these key competencies uh, of citizenship, that is where our law has promoted uh, road safety education. Why is it important to talk about competencies and not knowledge? Well, because this is addressed progressively in each different stage of learning, uh, different abilities or knowledge that are needed for children of that age are emphasized, and then they go on to the next stage and at the end of the process in road safety education we have citizens that at the age of 18 when they leave school are able to implement a style lifestyle that is sustainable healthy a mobility that is safe and uh, take on responsibilities i'm going to talk about each of these contents in the different stages of education but i wanted to mention something that is very important for us too and it's a step ahead in terms of this law in spain as in all countries in europe we have for many years been working on education in safety, rehabilitation of the areas around schools so that children can walk to school where no cars are allowed, promotion of bicycles and safety. We have worked at administrative level, private associations, uh, civil society, municipal police forces, but now this is the first time that a law makes it compulsory for these schools to promote that safety around schools. In this way, those of us who have worked on this for years don't call, don't start cold, so to speak. We now have people in the community 
who are, who are forced to do this and they must become familiar with it. So that makes it much easier for us to extend and include many more schools. And how does the Spanish educational system operate? We have some general skills and competences which children must acquire. Then there's specific skills and competences that they have to acquire at different stages. In order to check on those competences and skills, there have to be evaluation criteria. Because, of course, if something's not properly assessed, it's never taught in the same way. And so now there's evaluation for road safety skills and there's some basic knowledge that each child needs to acquire. In early edu childhood education, that's preschool age, you're teaching much more basic skills. There is a t uh, subject matter which is called growth in harmony in which children are talked, they're told about what their mobility habits are like, that they should be alert to how the city moves around them and people move around them, but of course adapted to the appropriate age group. And once we reach primary education, for those of you who are not familiar with the Spanish system, that's from the age of 6 to the age of 12, and it's a crucial f stage, our road safety education has been included in three subjects with the new law, and it approaches road safety from the three perspectives we discussed this morning. Principles, values, commitment, and they're covered in education in values. That's a subject in which they talk about mobility uh, in terms of sustainability and how children should eventually commit with sustainability. There's a lot about protecting the community. And then in the subject matter, which is basic life skills, there's a bit more theory because, of course, you do need children to understand traffic rules and understand traffic signals. And after that, and this is the newest element, that was general life skills. I hadn't changed the slide. But then in physical education, this is really new because in this subject, in some schools, they did cover it, but it was pretty rare. And now they necessarily have to include road safety in every year from 6 to 12 in the physical education subject. And so we have the three pillars. There are those subjects in which they will talk more about values and awareness. And then there's the subject in which they're going to cover the theory, the rules, traffic signals and so on. And then in physical education, it will all be approached from a more practical perspective. And so the first two years, they from six to eight years of age, in physical education, they approach the concepts of children as pedestrians. So they will go out walking. They will be shown the area around the school and what the risk factors might be. So the approach is the children as pedestrians or maybe users of public transport or passengers in their parents car and then later when children are eight and older we will include cycling as well spanish children must necessarily learn to ride a bicycle in physical education in school bicycle is included from the age of eight but then it continues all the way through the idea is to follow the European framework and so first to deal with the bicycle in within the school perimeter or in a park just basic handling because we're very used to seeing children dry, ride around our villages in their bicycles but it's important that they first learn to use them that we are sure that they have the necessary skills in terms of visibility or it's really important to teach them that just like they need their parents to check tire pressure in the car before they start a journey. They need to check that the tires on the bicycle are OK and that the brakes work and so on. And then when the children are older, they can start practicing using their bicycle outside the school walls the outside, with their teachers and support trainers. They will be riding their bicycle in a real street environment. And then we will include other modes of transport at a slightly later age. Here we're talking about 
non-electric scooters because or skateboards because children are under 16. But then in secondary education, we follow the same approach in the values subject. They will again talk about road safety and talk about risk factors, age-related risk factors, for example, because in secondary education, these are children from 12 to 16. And so these are children whose risk factors are different, who are beginning to move more independently and make their own mobility choices and are not as dependent on adults. And then what I found really interesting was to hear one of the previous speakers talk about including uh, road safety education in physics and chemistry and science subjects. And in fact, with the new law, it is included when you're being taught about Newton's laws, for instance, and don't ask me about those because I probably can't remember any of it, but to use examples of everyday road safety situations, that's actually included in the new law. And there's, there's also specific road safety topics in history or geography subjects where these children who are teenagers are told about the city, the urban environment, city planning, sustainable development goals, sustainable mobility and so on. And then once again in physical education we in include road safety topics. At this stage what we're going to do is to combine everything that has been taught before, they will still learn to get around in their bicycle and skateboards and so on, but we will include other age-appropriate topics like accident prevention, pass response, protect alert assist in case of accident, risk factors, traffic rules and so on. And so that's the end of compulsory secondary education in the country. As we can see, there's quite a lot of content here, but some children actually go on with their education an additional two years. And that's where, again, physical education plays the biggest role. Talk again about road safety, combining all the previous concepts, but adding, for example, critical attitude to mobility or accidents or anything that can happen around them. We also add road safety concepts in many other subjects, but more secondarily because, of course, those subjects are a lot more focused on the sciences and so on since they're preparing for university. But in the general subjects, we do include a lot of information on road safety, which will be part of the assessment process. That's the national law, but then in Spain the regions also have responsibilities in the area of education, so they will have to adapt the national legislation and can in fact increase or enhance the road safety curricula. And then each center, each school will determine or decide how many classroom hours and physical education hours will be spent on this. And teachers, of course, are crucial and their training is crucial. As we had before, they need to have support and resources and so on. And in fact, in order to make it easier for them to have those resources, we're working on developing them and, of course, from the DGT, we're developing these materials, but there's many other players in road safety, not just in the public sector, but also in civil society who are generating and disseminating resources for teachers. In the DGT, we produce our own resources, which we make available to schools and teachers. We have just published the new material for the preschool phase, and then we work on some guidelines and manuals for teachers and trainers, which we will also be publishing this week. These are manuals that we've created in cooperation with teachers, of course, above all, physical education teachers. And I have to say that from the start of the project, the Association of Physical Education Teachers have played a very active role to <coughs> include education for safe and sustainable mobility in their subject matter. And so we have some guidelines and manuals for each of the years so that the teachers teacher assistants or anyone 
working on road safety in a school will have the guidance they need, which includes why road safety education is important at that particular stage. We also talk about the strengths of that stage and the issues that a teacher might face at that stage. We also remind them of the compulsory curricular contents that must be included, and we provide links to different resources that teachers can access, as well as all the printed materials that include road safety education already. And then the next element in this strategy, as well as including road safety in the school curricula, the Spanish road safety strategy also defines specific actions for young people, as we heard in some of the previous presentations by Antonio, for example, from the TSC. The biggest problem uh, lies with children over 15, and that's why, as well as the curricula taught at schools, there should be specific actions targeting this age group. And we need to target this group specifically making them increasingly aware of risk factors. We've also carried out various initiatives. Safety Tunes was an EU project initially, and it's about generating discussion and a critical attitude amongst young people. These are activities that are carried out in groups of about 20 young people so that they can become aware of the problem and discuss it, and then themselves try and disseminate the message amongst other young people. That's a workshop that we've been holding for many years. We're now working with some universities so that it can be taught in universities and the students given credits. Because, of course, if you reward taking these courses, they will be a lot more willing to take part. And that's why we're going to award credits for these. We're also working on learning through play. We were talking about that earlier. And it's easier to reach people through play. And so we pre prepared us an escape room. There will be a virtual one soon in which the young people have to solve various steps and move on to the next. So these are just examples, but there's many more. And my colleagues from the different associations and from the MAFRA Foundation and so on will tell you about the different activities that they've carried out. But you really need to have specific actions for young people in order to try and reach them. Sometimes it's better to be less ambitious with the content, but to make sure that you reach them. Another activity which is included in the 2020, 2022 part of the strategy is specific initiatives for bicycles and PMV users who are already on the roads. So, of course, road safety in the schools is too late for them because they're already out on those roads. And I'm sure that this afternoon you'll hear about one of the activities of the training centers. There are many that are being carried out in Spain. And we, as well as providing in-person training, which is always best, we've also thought, realized that it was necessary to reach urgently with some basic road safety rules, a broader segment of the population and so we are offering online training through videos which have been very popular for general users of bicycles and PMVs. Specific training for delivery riders because I'm sure what's happening here is also happening in other countries where there's more and more people who are using bicycles or PMV for their job as delivering different products and so they need basic advice and, and reminders of basic rules, because there's quite a lot of ignorance on the rules, particularly for electric scooters. And we have pr established these online courses and videos so we can reach the largest possible number of citizens as quickly as possible. And we also have our training trainers courses that we have been providing for all the regions. Well, not all the regions, almost all the regions we are providing training for trainers. We started before the summer. We've scheduled courses all the way to December in order to achieve something else that was mentioned this morning, which is 
to have properly trained teachers because when we launch all this in the schools, we don't just need to have a law. We need to have the resources, the material, the support, and the teachers must have been trained appropriately. And the regional governments, which have the responsibility of implementing all this, have gotten to work and are training their teachers. <coughs> We're training a lot of them, particularly in the most innovative part, which is cycle training in physical education. And finally, the fourth pillar in our strategy for education, recently we have designed the first specific diploma on training for safe and sustainable mobility. It's an important diploma because it makes trainers professionals. They are training in driving schools for <coughs> standard driving licenses, but also for toxic and hazardous materials. And they can also provide training in schools and municipalities, etc. It's the first time we have this certificate, this diploma. And I think this month we have 12 or 13 professional training centers offering these courses all over the country. So it's become very popular. It's a two-year course. So it's professional training that begins at the end of compulsory secondary education. It's 2,000 hours of training and, and education. And they study all of these topics that you must know if you want to become a road safety professional. So they study road safety, driving techniques. These are practical hands-on classes, practical teaching of driving. So you are taught to teach people to drive, but also you learn teaching techniques, but also first aid and so on. And there are some modules on mobility management and sustainable mobility. So this is the first official diploma available in Spain for safe and sustainable mobility, which will begin this September. And it is, I think, the missing pillar because, of course, with the education law, it's the teachers in the schools that are going to have to provide the teaching in their various subjects, the physical education teachers as well as the teachers in the other subjects I've mentioned in the schools. But the plan's actually very ambitious because the schools on their own will not be able to train all of these students, as we heard before. What are we going to do when there aren't enough bicycles in the schools? And that's where the government and civil society need to come in and provide support. And these schools will also need some support for testimonials from accident victims, from local police, so that they can accompany them out uh, to cycle. And it's a project that involves a lot of different actors, all the stakeholders who have been for decades working in road safety, training, and education. And that's all from me. I just wanted to give you a bit of context of where we are in Spain. We now have the challenge of implementing the new plan and the new laws. And I know that the schools are very much focused on doing that. And this year, the education law comes into force for odd years. We always do the same with educational reform. So in years one, three, and fifth of primary and first and third of secondary school and so on. So we are there ready to support the schools. And in our next meeting a year from now, we hope to be able to tell you of a successful implementation. We're all really excited with this new program and this new phase. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, um, we do keep uh, uh, receiving a recurring question on uh, uh, the availability of the presentations. And uh, yes, I'm happy to confirm that this one, uh, uh, like the others, will be available uh, um, online. And uh, um, also a reminder, do not uh, forget to ask your questions online via the um, Q&A button. Um, last but not least for uh, the morning, Werner de Dobeler from the Flemish Foundation for uh, Traffic Knowledge, VSV, a partner in uh, uh, the project on uh, the pedestrian and cycling tests and certificates, a framework for pedestrian and cycling education in Flanders, Belgium. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you, Antonio. And, uh, 
Well, uh, good day to you all online and here in, uh, in Madrid in, uh, in, in the room. So I will be talking to you about uh, the pedestrian and cycling tests and certificates that we have in, in Flanders. It's indeed a framework for a pedestrian and cycling education in primary uh, education in uh, the region of Flanders in uh, Belgium. So uh, first of all, um, oops, presentation. Oh, sorry. That will be better like that. First of all, some words on our association uh, VSV, Flemish Foundation for Traffic uh, Knowledge. We were founded by the Flemish Parliament back in 1990. Our goal is uh, to have uh, zero uh, fatalities and zero seriously injured in uh, traffic in, in Flanders. So Vision Zero as, uh, as, as an, uh, let's say, an, uh, a final goal. The framework in which we work is the uh, Flemish uh, framework for uh, road safety, the road safety uh, strategy 2021 to 2025, of which, of course, education is uh, a part. And our activities are mainly centered on road user behavior, meaning uh, education and awareness raising uh, activities. Education for uh, a large number of audiences, starting from uh, schools and, and pupils, also for uh, employers, uh, local councils, uh, police uh, forces, but also driving instructors, for example, and local associations. And then awareness raising, we've got campaigns for uh, general uh, public, uh, for example, on speeding, as you see on the, uh, the small uh, photograph, that was the latest uh, campaign on speeding with it, and then uh, also for specific audiences, for example, <laughs> motorcyclists. And then, uh, after this uh, short word about uh, VSV, the larger picture uh, about which we are talking today, sustainable uh, development goals, of course, uh, of which road safety and sustainable mobility is just one small uh, part. And this uh, Vision Zero, uh, of course, uh, that, that guides uh, all the policy documents, I think, in, in the entire of uh, Europe, uh, so zero killed and seriously injured uh, road users uh, by 2050 or uh, even uh, sooner. But uh, to get to this uh, general aim, uh, this, this, uh, this general goal of uh, zero killed and seriously injured road users, we have to follow uh, a sometimes, uh, sometimes tricky path uh, consisting of many, many elements. Uh, you know uh, the classical elements. Uh, safe uh, drivers or safe uh, road users, also safe infrastructure, um, also the uh, let's say the enforcement uh, is part of that uh, of that bigger picture. But uh, to get to uh, the zero killed and seriously injured road users, of course, we're also talking about zero, zero uh, killed and seriously injured vulnerable uh, road users, and this is where our project comes into uh, focus. Zero killed and seriously injured vulnerable or active uh, road users. Of course, depends on the behavior of uh, the motorists, but also it depends on safe infrastructure and uh, safe uh, vehicles, but also on the cyclists and pedestrians' active road users' behavior themselves. So this is where education comes uh, into, uh, into the picture, and it's, that's what I'm going to talk about uh, today. So uh, what are the pedestrian and cycling tests and certificates in Flanders? In fact, it's an integrated uh, teaching uh, method, as we call it, integrated teaching and training method, starting at uh, a very early age, age three to four onwards, to the age of 12, so in, for preschool children and uh, uh, primary school children in uh, Flanders. It's uh, based on the official attainment uh, levels for road safety education set by the Flemish government. I'll come back to that uh, uh, right, uh, right away. It's, uh, most importantly, it's a graduated method. So we start with the basic skills that you need to, uh, to walk safely, to cycle safely. Uh, it's a step-by-step -step learning uh, process based on the pupils' functional uh, capacities and uh, abilities according, of course, uh, to their uh, age. Also, um, the operational objectives for this, uh, these uh, pedestrian and cycling uh, education uh, are uh, related to uh, the skills 
the knowledge and the attitudes that the children need at uh, a given stage to perform uh, uh, safely as uh, either a pedestrian or a cyclist. And this is tested uh, in uh, a series of uh, tests and exams leading to uh, traffic certificates, as we call it. We've got the bronze, silver and gold certificates for uh, cyclists or for pedestrians and the balance bike, bronze and silver and golden certificates for cyclists. And here you see uh, a logical model of this uh, training and testing uh, series. So we start for pedestrians at the age of uh, three to four with, of course, training in, uh, in, in a secured environment, for example, on school playground. And this is followed by uh, a first test at the age of five, giving way to the bronze uh, certificate for the, uh, let's say, the basic skills you need as a, a pedestrian, followed again by two years of uh, training in the school environment uh, and then a test for the silver certificate. Again, uh, training and then uh, the grand pedestrian exam, as we call it, in which we test the children's abilities uh, in uh, real traffic uh, conditions. And if this gives way to the gold uh, certificate for pedestrians. And then the same logic for uh, the cyclist uh, education. So you get uh, clearly an idea what we're talking about. Some word about the Flemish education system, and the previous speaker already uh, pointed out the, the, the really very uh, complete uh, educational goals here in Spain. Uh, we don't have that uh, as detailed uh, as it is here in, in Spain, unfortunately. So we've got um, final goals for competencies for uh, children in uh, primary schools. Those are defined by the Flemish uh, government and they, uh, they specify the mandatory uh, knowledge and skills per grade needed, uh, so to what pupils need to know and be able to do at a given age at, uh, when completing uh, a grade. The attainment levels are in fact a set of minimum objectives uh, related to the knowledge, the insight and the skills needed uh, by uh, the children. And schools must work towards uh, reaching the attainment levels, that's mandatory, but uh, the schools are free to determine the way in which they, uh, their lesson content and teaching methods lead up to uh, reaching these uh, attainment uh, levels. And of course, we from VSV will provide schools with ample uh, support uh, for uh, traffic education uh, in, uh, in this uh, respect. Now, coming to the attainment levels for uh, traffic education in primary uh, schools, uh, at completion of primary schools, the law says, pupils must be able to locate uh, dangerous traffic conditions in the wider school environment. They must have sufficient responsiveness, balance, sense of coordination and know the traffic rules for cyclists and pedestrians to be able to move independently and safely along a familiar route. And they must also show willingness to consider other road users uh, in their uh, behavior. So uh, clearly uh, a set of uh, clearly defined, um, let's say, objectives for uh, road safety education at primary school uh, level. Uh, set by the government. Now, um, I'll just explain the main principles of uh, the cycling and pedestrian education uh, learning line, the certificates, uh, and how they correspond to the uh, uh, recommendations in the learn manual, more specifically about the objectives for uh, these uh, cycling certificates and what the learn manual says about uh, well objectives, setting objectives and how to uh, reach them. So just a, a small um, set of examples. The learn manual recommends to link the activity of course to the general strategy, for example casualty reduction in road users providing uh, education. Our strategy is lowering casualties uh, in young pedestrians and cyclists uh, in, by providing teaching methods for schools and uh, teachers and educational uh, tools and support for uh, teachers so to give these uh, lessons uh, on cyclist and pedestrian uh, education. The school uh, curriculum also is uh, of course uh, a, given, uh, a given set of, of rules 
uh, and we link, we try to link to the different curriculum elements uh, in our project uh, defined by the school uh, networks that may be public schools or private schools. And also the national goals, as I said, for traffic uh, safety and uh, mobility education. Our project is clearly linked to the official attainment levels in uh, Flanders for uh, primary uh, schools. Now, another set of recommendations from the LEARN manual is to decide whether the learning uh, outcome is related to either actual behavior or intentions to engage in the behavior. And in the pedestrian and cycling uh, certificates, uh, clearly our learning outcome is related to actual behavior because uh, the pupils need to perform safely in real traffic uh, conditions for the Gold Pedestrian Certificate and the Golden Cycling uh, Certificate. And this actual behavior is uh, tested in various conditions accord according to the level of uh, the pupils. For example, the Bronze Pedestrian uh, Certificate is uh, tested in a protected environment, let's say uh, the school uh, playground or another protected environment where uh, children can uh, step uh, safely. The silver pedestrian certificate is in uh, real traffic conditions but under adult supervision. So you also have uh, a kind of, uh, let's say, uh, um, a safe environment that is uh, created. And then the golden pedestrian certificate is, uh, as I said, tested in real traffic conditions with uh, adults only as observers to see if the child performs uh, all the uh, tasks as they should be uh, performed. Now, um, another set of recommendations from LEARN is to formulate the outcomes in terms of uh, operational objectives. So not only the general uh, goals, but uh, very operational uh, objectives to define what elements specifically uh, you want to change, to what extent and uh, in what time frame. Now the operational objectives for our certificates for pedestrians and cyclists are the specific skills of course needed to succeed uh, the exams, uh, the bronze, uh, the silver and the gold uh, certificates uh, uh, resulting from the exams and time frame is uh, the lessons uh, in which uh, this, uh, these uh, uh, skills are taught and also the practical training sessions leading up to the test and the exam. And then uh, also we define uh, our objectives in, uh, in terms of smarter, specific, measurable, achievable, time-bound, etc. Uh, we do this uh, for the skills and sub-skills for the Grand Pedestrian exam and also for the Grand uh, Cycling exam. Some examples in the next uh, slides. And then the operational objectives are used as a roadmap for uh, designing the activity and also its uh, evaluation. And so, uh, in our case, uh, they are used as milestones in our integrated uh, teaching uh, strategy for pedestrians and cyclists from the age of 4 to the age of uh, 12. Now, some examples on uh, operational objectives that we defined for the Grand uh, Pedestrian Exam. Specific skills needed to succeed the exam. For example, recognize dangerous situations and respond safely to them in uh, the traffic uh, environment. Choose a safe part of the road uh, to walk if there is no footpath. So where do you walk if uh, you can't walk on the, uh, on, on the footpath? Do you walk on the, on, on the cycle lane, for example, if there's a cycle lane? Or do you walk on the roadway? And so uh, in, what, in which uh, direction? Walk left on the roadway if there is no footpath. Eh? So on the, hard, on the hard, hard shoulder or on the bike path. Walk on the roadway along an obstacle if the, uh, the, the, the footpath is completely uh, blocked. And then also skills related to crossing the road safely at zebra crossing with or without traffic lights in different uh, traffic uh, conditions and also cross at uh, a level crossing where this is uh, appropriate. For example, in schools with uh, a level crossing nearby, this is very important, of course, to test this uh, ability as uh, well. But then each operational objectives, as, as you see them here, is then defined as a set of sub-skills. I'll just give an example of that. The subdivision of skills to cross the road at the safest uh, place. So the pupil must uh, choose a place with good visibility, so not in a bend, not between parked cars, for example, or not near obstacles. He or she should, should stop at the curb, should look left and right several times, not once, 
uh, should cross perpendicular to the road if the road is free, uh, should keep looking out while crossing, uh, should keep his or her pace without running, and uh, should behave uh, safely so doesn't take uh, risks. And then you see a kind of uh, well graded uh, document there for uh, with the number of the pupils. The, uh, when they perform the exam, they each have uh, a number on their front and back. And so uh, the uh, observer just notes the errors that are made uh, or the points where it went uh, okay. And this leads to a general score on this uh, subskill. Uh, so for this uh, pedestrian uh, exam. Same thing for the cyclist exam, the grand cycling exam, specific skills needed to succeed this exam, how to look over the shoulder while staying on course, extend one's arm to announce a maneuver, for example, turn right, turn left, cycle past an obstacle, take into account pedestrians on a zebra crossing, take into account passengers getting out of a car, so opening doors, take into account oncoming traffic and traffic approaching from uh, the rear, cycle, cycle to a zebra crossing, get off and cross at crossing uh, on foot, use a cycle path where required, uh, cycle on the right side of the roadway if uh, there is no cycle path and give way where this is uh, required. So each of these uh, operational objectives again is defined as a set of sub-skills and the uh, one example of um, these sub-skills for uh, the cycling on the right side of the roadway. The pupil should uh, cycle on the right side of the roadway at sufficient distance from parked cars. So uh, just to not to be uh, to, to, to come into confrontation with uh, people opening doors from the car. He or she doesn't cut off bends and doesn't take bends too wide either. Uh, he or she should only move to the left if there is an obstacle or when overtaking uh, another cyclist and should also behave safely, so not taking any risks. And again, you see the scorecard with the different, uh, the different uh, items for uh, the pupils. So this is uh, how we uh, work uh, uh, in terms of operational objectives and uh, specific sub-objectives. And then also we formulate output objectives for our, uh, for our project. So the Flemish primary schools count about 70,000 uh, pupils per grade. And based on that uh, number, we've defined uh, output objectives for the grand pedestrian exam and the grand uh, cycling exams. Per school year, at least 25,000 pupils should take the grand pedestrian exam and another 25,000 should take the grand uh, cycling exam. And this corresponds to about 35% of all pupils in those particular uh, grades. Of course, the long-term aim is to reach 100% uh, of pupils in Flemish primary uh, schools. Now, the results uh, from uh, last year, uh, we've got uh, 25,000 participants for the, grand, uh, particip for the grand pedestrian exam and the 87% success rate, which is uh, quite, uh, quite high. And then for the grand cyclist exam, we've got 26,000 uh, participants and a 90% uh, success rate. So we see that the success rates are quite uh, high. Of course, this depends on the schools uh, giving enough training leading up to the exam and also, very importantly, uh, if uh, so this, this should be part of a larger uh, trajectory starting at preschool age and ending at the age of 10 uh, to 12 uh, years of age. So uh, some practicalities, all practical guides, uh, materials and step-by-step -step instructions for uh, these, uh, these learning lines for pedestrians and cyclists are uh, freely available at our uh, website. It's only in Dutch, it's verkeeropschool.be. And there, schools and pupils can find all the information uh, they need. Um, really very practical guidelines on how to set up uh, uh, pedestrian and cyclist education. We've got videos on how to do that uh, and uh, a lot of uh, teaching uh, materials as well. So, thank you. That was it for my part. Thank you, Thank you very much. And uh, um, now, um, 
Just to say that uh, uh, when it comes to um, the Q&A, we've received more comments than uh, uh, questions uh, online, and uh, uh, most of the questions uh, um, refer to um, the role of uh, um, e-scooters and new um, personal mobility devices. Um, we will not take those straight away because we do have uh, a presentation on uh, um, uh, scooters from uh, um, our member Senai. Uh, so, uh, unless there are questions from the floor right now? No, I don't see any. So, uh, given that we are um, running a bit late, I suggest that uh, uh, we break for lunch and uh, uh, we will uh, resume uh, promptly at uh, um, 2 o'clock Madrid time for uh, uh, part 3 of uh, the seminar. Thank you very much. So good afternoon ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. I hope for those who were online who had the, they had the opportunity to eat and not only to check their emails. Um, we uh, starting uh, with the uh, second session, well actually it's part three of uh, um, today's seminar. What we're going to do in the afternoon in the next two hours is to look at projects from uh, across Europe on uh, um, traffic safety and mobility education. Some of the presentations will be online, some uh, um, will be um, in person. We we'll start with uh, uh, one presentation which is uh, um, given online by uh, Sandra Agbabiaka and Max Murcock from uh, uh, the London Borough of uh, um, Hackney. Uh, floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me okay. I'm not too sure um, because I can't hear anyone else. Uh, um, good afternoon. My name is Sandra Babiaka, and uh, I have my colleague here, Max Moorcock. And thank you so much for inviting us to um, present our collision investigation workshop. Um, we're really, really happy to be here because it's one of the many tools that we use to uh, provide road safety education. We're part of the education, training, and publicity team for road safety, which of course is engineering, engagement, uh, um, and also raising awareness for our active travels. Um, the London Borough of Hackney is a very young borough. Uh, we have about approximately 40% between 20 and 40 years, and uh, our under 15s up to 19 years old make about 24%. So we're very, very interested in one of the many um, programs that we provide to engage with 11 year olds and up to 16 and 17 year olds. So, so the collision investigation workshop is one of the packages that we use to engage with our students. So, next. so when we talk about our collision investigation, one of the possible uh, outcomes and one of the outcomes that we would really like to have is to recognize possible hazards related to active travel for the students to understand common causes of collisions and to identify behaviors that will help us stay safer on the roads. So, and please bear in mind, we go into the schools and work with the students uh, on these particular items. So, so when we look at uh, any of the collision investigations that we're talking about, it's all centered around vision zero, which I know the previous presenter was referring to and of course we um, work with Vision Zero within our road safety aspect and also the five pillars of action. Uh, we make sure that these are contemplated and are within part of the segment. The actual workshop itself is very versatile. It can be a minimum of 30 minutes to a maximum of 60 minutes presentation. It can be a one-off. It can be integrated with the collision investigation workshop and the future of our roads. Um, it can be work broken down into segments, it can have site visits, it really depends on what and who you're working with. Um, the really good uh, point about this particular workshop is we can adapt it to any of the schools, any of the areas, uh, any of the issues that the schools may have because we look at the travel plans that are presented from the actual schools themselves. Uh, I'm now going to hand you over to my colleague Max, so forgive us because we have a very <laughs> funny, funny rotation table. We will now tell you 60 minutes into five seconds. Okay. Plan. <laughs> Good afternoon. 
Um, so we start off our um, activity with children after a brief introduction, looking at a quick true or false um, quiz. Basically, the reason why we do this is obviously to test the knowledge of the children before um, they we, we, we do the workshop. Um, but we also do a, a repeat um, quiz at the end to test their knowledge afterwards. So this serves as an evaluation because obviously it's very difficult for us to evaluate um, how effective our um, inter interactions are. Um, obviously, you can look at casualty statistics, etc. But you know those those you know you can't say those are directly related to. Um, we also send it to uh, send an evaluation to the teachers are following the evaluation at the workshop in order to uh, to get their views on how the children have retained the knowledge. Um, the next thing we do with the children is we start what we call a jam board, which is on Google, which is basically where, you know, so we can uh, gather ideas. Um, and with this, we will get the children to suggest the benefits of active travel um, and looking at how it actually um, benefits themselves as well as the wider picture, you know, the environment, etc. cetera. Um, but we also look at the children's concerns um, because we want to make sure that we can um, address any concerns they have, because obviously many of them might be just perceived concerns that we can then alleviate before we even get started on the subject. The main part of the uh, workshop is made up with what we call our SMIDSI. So that's what we refer to in this country as, sorry mate, I didn't see you, which is unfortunately an all too common uh, phrase that's used on our roads by people who have uh, you know, collided with someone else. Um, so we explain to the children that they're going to be the uh, attending officer, a police officer at a road collision, um, and we ask them to, to, uh, to tell us what they should be looking for. Um, we do this with this next slide. So um, here we have on the left hand side, you can see we have a, a short form that we ask them to complete. Um, and to complete this, we use the information on the right hand side. So for, we'll split them into groups of five. Generally, it's about six groups per class. Um, and we'll have six different scenarios. All the different scenarios will uh, use different modes of transport in different situations, different circumstances. We hold back the uh, the contributing factors that the police have decided on um, in these real real life um, collisions. All of them are, are based on collisions that have happened in Hackney in the last five years. Um, and then the children will then will uh, at the end when we uh, come back together to discuss, we'll add in what the police actually the, the uh, conclusions the police came to as well. Okay, well, I'll hand you back to Sandra. <laughs> Sorry about that. Let me just put myself in the right mirror. No, no, uh, no. Oh, there, there I am. am. <laughs> so the second segment of the workshop itself um, is called the future of our roads. And this is, um, again, a segment that can either be a follow on to the various uh, workshops that we've done with our students because of course we have a program that goes literally from cradle to grave, we call it. Um, and this is talking about how the children or how the pupils, uh, students perceive the future of our roads. So, so always acting on the Vision Zero uh, remit, uh, we look at um, whether or not the you know safer roads uh, or we should have better segregated system. And this also looks at the speeds uh, and also look at the cycling facilities, what is the proportion of the roads that should be dedicated to pedestrians, how are the shared, perceived shared facilities for pedestrians and cyclists, what are the conflicts, uh, what are the conclusions, et cetera, et cetera. So all these can come out again through a Jamboard um, scenario that we do, or we can go out on site and do it and uh, you know pick a scenario and look at it from that point of view. Um, we also took, we'll look at the children's uh, thoughts on micro mobility so the famous e-scooters uh, our driverless vehicles uh, whether or not the intelligent speed assistant revolution is you know something that should be taken forward more revolution in history of safety devices so there are a lot of many different aspects of this particular segment that we can connect to the curriculum of the schools um, um, when we talk about also the future we talk about well what would our um vehicles look like in the future will we ever be able to have our fantastic flying and our very own delorean who knows it's something that of course we let the children expand on and have a little bit of leeway and a little bit of fantasy from that aspect uh, so again as i said before right at the beginning we can tailor this to a younger age group as we can tailor it to an older age group and i think this is 
the best bit of the versatility of these different workshops that we do. So to conclude, the workshops allow us to understand pupils' issues, if they have any, allows pupils to participate and discuss. We really uh, would like to make sure that the pupils are the one leading the workshops rather than us talking at them. So it's something that we know about. We're very keen on when we do our sessions. Uh, it ticks many curriculum boxes and it sits within um, something that we call in England, uh, personal social health and economic education which is something that is part of the curriculum. And it allows, allows us to obviously provide information and road safety messages. And it is talking to all road users. So it's not a specific category, it's every single road user and future road users, of course. So, and who knows, we might even inspire future carers, sorry, future uh, careers from engineers to data analysis. And of course, amazing road safety officers like ourselves, yay. So thank you very much for your time. Um, there are details up on the screen, as you can see, if anybody would like to have any further information or a particular talk through, we try to keep it very, very brief, uh, then please, by all means, get in touch with us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sandra. Thank you very much, Max, for uh, um, finding the time today to connect and uh, uh, to give this very interesting presentation on uh, the um, uh, Collision Data um, Workshop. Um, so, next uh, uh, presentation will be from Marco Goyos of Aisleme and uh, uh, Ignacio Liarcio of Face Vial on uh, um, 32 years of road prevention and uh, mobility campaigns for children and uh, youngsters. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Ah, que no había sonido, perdón. Repite. Hello. Hello, Antonio. Hello, Mar. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm Nacho Lejarcio. I'm a researcher from the University of Valencia. I'm um, pre manager of Festival Spanish Road 50 Foundation. Uh, I voy a hacer mi intervención en Spanish, in my original language, too, en español. Y uh, simplemente quería la experiencia que les quiero trasladar aquí. So you, you need to. Good. This is not. Good, as I was saying, uh, what I am presenting Good, this is the, we call it the Road Safety Commitment Forum. When the subdirector for traffic affairs has told us that told you that we had a law in Spain, and that in education we already included the concepts for road safety training, this is not something that the current government has done. Uh, for more than 20 years, a lot of associations have worked and put pressure and lobbied and invited different fora and. Uh, 
invited all the uh, players, the ministry, the Home Office, the traffic authorities and the competent minist ministries and agencies because we always used to say at every meeting we had, uh, road, education say, road education is a pending subject and we wanted that to solve that problem and a group of uh, associations, I don't know, this is going to, I want it in presentation mode, can I have it in presentation mode? Thank you. Right. A group of uh, associations or entities decided to get together and create what we call a forum. In old ancient Greek, the forum was the space, the square, the main square where thought, beliefs and thoughts were exchanged. So we decided, a group of us decided, that worked unilaterally uh, on road safety to get together to join our efforts so that we could lobby authorities so that what happened in December last year happened. We had a, finally a road safety law in Spain and we invented this forum, we created this forum with different entities and our idea was to create a space for thought exchange of ideas between agencies and associations that had to do with road safety and the state administration. If you want to do the same in your countries, you have to, re you have to get the ad administration involved, governments, people who are responsible so that you really create a law for road safety to be included in education and all fields of life. Now, <clears throat> what associations uh, were behind this initiative. MAFRE Foundation was one of them. We are here today at the MAFRE Foundation. The University of Valencia, the Spanish Association for Road Safety and the Association for Spine Injuries, AESLIME, and uh, many other associations have gradually joined our effort. They all have to do with road safety, safety the National Confederation of uh, uh, driving schools and other associations and we realized that if we got together we would achieve our aim and these are the associations that promoted this and the participant associations. On, 11th, on the 11th of December 2017 we had our first forum at the at Parliament, in the Parliament building here in Madrid and we asked the government directly, 2017, 19, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, five years with the crisis, health crisis in the middle, finally after five years we have got a law act which uh, contemplates uh, road safety training. And then finally on the 29th of March this year, in this room, we welcomed and presented, we had the third meeting of the forum to set up the new commitments and present the DGT and the Ministry, traffic authorities and the Ed Ministry for Education presented the LOLM, the new uh, education law which includes uh, road, road uh, safety education. Now what's the goal of the forum? Well, I recommend this as a good practice to improve road safety and mobility of people through implementing road safety and road education throughout the whole cycle of life in order to reduce accidents, mortality and injuries caused in our roads by accidents. That's our main objective or goal. What other goals, specific goals do we have? These seven here. Obviously, this, the two, three and four, introduce the law, promote the law, we've got that. But we've got new challenges and goals. We've got the law as an essential principle for road safety that is included in the education law. It's put into context in terms of social values, community values, and then training of teachers. Those have been covered, but we have to continue to promote training and recycling 
uh, promote co-participation and then promote cooperation and coordination with the different levels of the administration. So we've done this. This is the milestone, the law, the first law, then the decrees, royal decrees as we call them in Spain, and then minimal uh, requirements for teaching or minimal, minimum teaching. We're not talking about road education in terms of traffic alone, uh, traffic lights. It's also important to talk about community values, social values, tolerance, respect, solidarity. All that is ver very important too, even management of consumption, because if I buy something, if I buy something at my, the, my local market or my, at a local shop, but then I order something else from a platform in Asia through the internet, consumption generates mobility and responsible consumption is also important because when we buy something online, it has to be brought to us and that has a cost. Good. And now we have new objectives. New objectives that we have that are summarized to finish we, in, our new, in our new forum. We've got the law, but what's our current goal? To uh, continuously supervise uh, compliance with that law and help schools and professionals and teachers to achieve the objectives of the law and that no school, no ch ch child is left out and do a follow-up of the strong points and weak points that the law might exhibit and translate that into good practices and through the EU and other projects, Learn Project and others to the EU and say this is what we've done in Spain. Don't do this because it didn't work and maybe you can learn from this. Sometimes they say, have you got a manual of good practices? I say, no, I don't have a manual of good practices. I have a manual of bad practices because you often learn more from the bad than from the good. So that's all. I have to say that an association like this manages, supervises, collaborates with the administration and possibly in March, March 2023, we will have a new forum with a day devoted and possibly the first conference on road safety education in order to know what is being done, what are the weak points, the strong points and how to overcome barriers. And I hope to be able to tell you more after the next event. Thank you. One hundred and fifty people online that you are more comfortable without raining in your home or in your work. So uh, welcome to everybody. I'm going to speak about how the uh, social civility will work in order to help. Uh, at the end, I, I did in English, and my English is not so good that you see. So I will start in Spanish next. The English come to me. ASLEME is an association, uh, it's a bit different. We were created in 1990. Last week we were 32 years old, it was our birthday. And uh, what is our aim? Well, to prevent uh, road accidents, deaths and injuries. Through how? Well, by educating people and by educating people in terms of road safety and values. For how long have we been doing this? For 32 years. Now, how many children, teenagers and young people have we reached? More than 4 million. Uh, why do I say we are different? Well, we are different because Ais Leme was created as, the, as a result of a study that was carried out by Dr. Garcia Reneses from one of the largest hospitals in Madrid, who that dealt with spinal injuries uh, resulting from road accidents and a professor of preventive medicine from the University, Autonomous University of Madrid Medicine, the medical school, who did a study between 1980 and 1989. What was the result of that study? 
Well, after that study, they saw that uh, there'd been a three-fold increase in the number of severe injuries resulting from traffic accidents, road accidents, that the top 18 to 25-year-olds were the most affected and that it was three males for every female. So doc these doctors, the doctor and the professor, created ASLEME in 1990. Most of the creators and founders and who are on the board still are doctors. They are doctors, physici physicians. We began, two of us, a doctor and I, started in 1990. When in Spain there were 9,500 deaths in road accidents which was tremendous. Uh, now I have to say that uh, there's more than two of us now, that 200 we have trainers, 200 trainers and teachers in Spain who work every day at schools uh, on the matter of uh, road safety for different ages. We explain the risks of every different age. We explain and adapt and adjust the content to each age and it's 12, we have 12 road education uh, programs at ASLEME, three of them for up to 18 year olds and two for young people between 18 and 25. So we have five programs, specific programs for children, teenagers and youth. And um, around uh, what it makes us different? Well, first of all, <coughs> we, we have a lot of expertise. We have experts that have trained very well in, in teaching pedagogy, road education. They have all the masters that you can think of at the DGT, the traffic authorities, universities, and they have thousands of hours of training in road safety. Of these people, 90 of them, 90 are also spinal injury victims like me because of a road accident. Aisleme is 32. I'm, I've been in a wheelchair for 35 years because I don't, I won't tell you what, how old I was when I had the accident because then you'd know what my, my age is. But I was very young. Uh, I was younger, younger. And uh, in in September it will be the anniversary of this accident which gave me a second life really because I almost died. I was involved in a terrible accident. The car went round and round. I was saved by my seat belt and I, the seat caused me a tetraplegia because it's stuck into my neck. Um, the headrest, the headrest. But I had studied psychology and I decided to change course. And I said, why do I not devote my life to, do, to prevent this from happening to others? So I was captured in the best sense of the word by those two doctors to lead Aisleme. And that's how we began, two of us, and now it's, there's 200 of us. And spinal injury victims include psychologists, lawyers, journalists, engineers, different people from different walks of life, and another 100 people are health workers who work in the 112, which is the emergency medical services in Madrid, 112, and they work in hospitals and emergency services. So. I'm happy now because we finally have the road safety and education law and I'm sure it's a great law and this year is the first year and we'll have to see how it works out but I think we will become a model for the rest of Europe and I think we can say that it has been done very well and it has been done by all stakeholders. 
the traffic authorities and the Ministry of Education, whenever on their own, they knew that they could resort to us in civil society for anything they needed, and, and they did. And that's why I'm so happy. And of course, the concept now is different. We're talking about safe and sustainable mobility, healthy mobility as well, because we shouldn't forget that we do have quite an avoidable pandemic. When we talk about health, we're not just talking about people who are killed or injured or disabled for the rest of their lives due to a traffic accident. We know that health, if people have active mobility and walk more or cycle more, will be healthier and live longer, right? And uh, things are moving really fast. When Asleme was founded, as I said, 9,500 people were killed uh, every year in road accidents. But, um, okay, yeah, this one. So 1,755 people were killed on the roads in Spain in 2019, which is the last year before the pandemic where we have official comparable statistics. It had been 9,500 just 32 years ago, minus three, so that's uh, 29 years ago. And so there's been tremendous improvements. A lot of things have changed in Spain in that time, but I can assure you that every institution in here I, of course, include the local police forces who have done excellent work with road safety education these years. And we were always told initially that road safety Im education impacts you can only measure medium and long term and that we needed more immediate measures. But can you believe that after 32 years, I still come across people who say, oh, road safety education only has an impact on the medium and the long term. And I say, well, 32 years, 5 million people, is that still not having an immediate impact? Of course, education has an impact because young children today will be adults in just a few years. And so it's extremely important that they receive the right training and education. And when we're speaking about severe injuries, you should realize that when we speak about brain or spinal cord injuries or amputations, and these are the latest statistics we have in Spain, these are lifelong disabilities. There's no cure. And education saves lives. Pythagoras said, educate children and you will not have to punish the men. It doesn't seem like we have taken this on board as yet. But why do we work in education in values and in road safety education in Asleme? Because we feel that empathy, respect, solidarity, responsibility, peaceful coexistence are crucial to collective safety. This is what the children learn in all of these classes. And that's what we've been trying to teach them over these years so that they can learn through these positive values. And our methodology is very simple. We generally do a um, field work in schools for all ages, including professional training centers. And we also go to universities and to military academies, because these are young people who are between 18 and 25 who will eventually become professional members of our armed forces. And generally, our workshops and seminars are in person and they last about two hours and are taught by a, f some, a health professional and somebody who suffered a spinal injury and is in a wheelchair due to a road accident. And so they know what they're talking about. And I love to see that I'm the only one in a wheelchair in this room today. I suppose perhaps some of you who are following it via the well, online might have suffered a spinal injury or might have a relative who has done so. But I would like everyone who works in road safety in whatever field, whenever you think about consequences, think about putting yourself in my shoes or in the shoes of a mother who's lost a child. You can be uh, an expert in whatever field you like, engineering, psychology, education, 
But if you're not able to put yourself in those shoes, if you don't have empathy, you will not be able to convey the right messages when you teach and when you train. And so when we talk to them, they can tell that we are speaking from the heart about the, co the causes that are linked to the consequences. And all campaigns have the same four elements. The content may change because the risks will vary depending on the age of the audience. And so we adapt the presentation accordingly and the videos. But the contents are the same. It's about primary prevention. And that's about being aware of the risks of mobility in all modes and all vehicle types, including according to their age. We'll start with them as pedestrians or passengers, but then we'll add bicycles and mopeds and scooters and so on. And of course, with that, we'll have to talk about the risks and the mitigating or preventive measures that they can take to manage those risks. Secondary prevention is what they can do if they suffer an experience, an accident. Depending on their age, the most important thing is for them to know what not to do. To call 112, dial 112, and don't move anybody. Wait for health professionals to arrive. Of course, as they get older, you can give them additional information. And then when you explain how much a life can change after an accident, what can happen to you, and how you can live a second life with more difficulties, which you will share. But you always tell them also about all the things that you are still able to do, even though your life has changed and there is a before and after. You can still have a happy and productive life. So when you talk about prevention, we also have to talk about accessibility because cities need to be accessible and a pedestrian in a wheelchair. And I will not be a safe pedestrian if the city is not accessible. I could fall into a hole. I could fall down a steep slope or be stuck in front of a staircase. So these are the four campaigns. We start with the youngest, which is moving safe in the city, which is for primary education. And this has been, and it could happen to you. That's a campaign we've been running for 32 years. And when you're in control, you'll be you'll be sure to return, and that's about avoiding drinking, and then hold on to life, which is specific for university students, and then there's protect yourself, which is similar to hold on to life in its content, but targeting specifically the young people who are studying in military academies all over Spain. So, of course, I'm just giving you a really brief description, but in moving safely around your city, we tell them what to do as pedestrians or when they're cycling or when they're passengers in a car or a bus, the care they should take, and, well, the usual content. It's just so you can see one of the slides and what it looks like, because, of course, each course is a two-hour course, as I said. It could happen to you is our oldest campaign, because it was the first we started. We now have 12 different programs. And this is of targeting mostly secondary school students and university students too. And the next one is when you're in control, you'll be sure to return. These are specifically about alcohol and drug consumption and traffic. And we were finalists last year in the European uh, Institute Awards. And hopefully one day we will win. It was the first time we actually were finalists in an ETSC awards uh, ceremony. And we tell them about alcohol and the effect that alcohol can have, uh, which they're not aware of because you know that young people always think that they're in control and they don't really assess the risks properly. They, f they think they can deal with anything. They overestimate their abilities and they think, well, three, four drinks is not very much. I'm fine to drive. And so with them in very practical terms in the workshop, you can show them what the actual consequences and impacts are of drinking. And most importantly, those urban legends about if I drink a little coffee, I'm going to be OK. And most importantly, we work with them on peer pressure so that they can learn to say no to their peers. No, I'm not going to drink. Because peer pressure often encourages them to drink or take drugs even if they don't want to. 
And then the last part, the what to do part, here the recommendations include something that's really important. It's always best not to drink, to decide before you leave the house who the designated driver should be, public transport or a taxi or whatever that they can share. And most importantly, how to prove that you're a good friend. Do not allow your friend to drive if he's been drinking. Take away the keys, recommend that they take a taxi, drive them home. Do not let them drive home. Why? Another thing that worries me and worries I think most of us in this field is that now there's a lot of mobility amongst young people who are not getting their driver's license but using those personal mobility vehicles and also car sharing applications. What does that mean? That they decide to leave home in it and they go off in a taxi but then on the way home they might find one of those electric scooters or one of those electric bicycles, uh, all of it for ride sharing. And since they've been drinking, they might think, oh, well, I can just grab one of these and ride home. And that's dangerous. And we need to avoid this type of vehicle from being f easily available near places where young people drink. And this is in universities in both the drink and drug programs and in the universities and in the military academies we use glasses and a helmet to simulate what happens when you drink or take drugs and we show them very simple exercises so they can realize with that level of drinking or drug taking how it is impossible for example to get a pen inside a bottle and what are the advantages to finish well first of all you're able to show them the cause and effect relationship. When I explain to them that because of wearing the headrest on my neck, I was paralyzed, or because if you're not wearing your seatbelt, you will be thrown out of the vehicle and suffer a spinal injury. And if you're not wearing a helmet on a scooter or on a moped, you could hit your head and have a traumatic brain injury. They see very quick clearly, because you've explained it, what the cause is and the effect and proximity because the person telling them is not their teacher, nor their parent, nor an authority figure like a police officer. It's a health professional whom they feel is someone who knows what they're talking about because they work in a hospital and someone who's experienced it firsthand. And so we become very visible and credible trainers. And of course, veracity. Of course, there are no actors sitting there in a wheelchair. Everyone who's there in a wheelchair is truly paralyzed. And of course, in life, you could say that Aleme does everything great, and, and you might wonder why you should believe me. And it, it's like anything else. I always felt that when the road safety law came out, I Lemed obtained the ISO uh, road safety education and security certification. We already did that because if you don't assess your results, you never know if you're doing things well or not. And we always have a questionnaire, a feedback form that we give teachers or the person who's in charge of the group. And they have to fill it in, in and answer questions about the methodology, the content, the duration, the quality of their speakers, whether they thought it was effective for road safety, if they feel it could reduce accident rates. And so we always hand round these forms after. And then we also give a questionnaire before and after to the students. And that way we can see what their level of knowledge and their attitudes were before our two-hour talk and their knowledge and attitude after the course. And when after two or three years we have a sample of 5,000 or 6,000 different student questionnaires, we do a study. We currently have one whose results are about to be published in an international publication to prove how both significantly improve. And these are the outcomes of the different campaigns. You can't see the blue bars too clearly, but the average is 4.8 out of 5, which is the highest score and about whether it's effective to improve road safety or to prevent accidents, we're at 99% yeses. In most cases, it's 100, 
but in others it's 98% who think that yes, they are effective preventing more people from being involved in an accident. We call it a road-related incident these days. I'm not sure in Spain, um, and we've sort of gotten accustomed to that term instead of speaking about traffic accidents. But anyway, we're all talking about the same thing after all. Thank you very much, everyone. It thinks it's our aim, it's our objective of all the people are here. Thank you very much. to Mark for this very um, inspiring uh, um, presentation that we had today. And uh, uh, we now have uh, uh, Ruben Cano from uh, Senai. Welcome on uh, um, training program for young personal mobility devices users, which is also one of the questions we had uh, uh, this morning during the first session. Hello, everybody. At first, I would like to apologize with you uh, because I am going to do my speech in, in Spanish because it's my mother language and I feel more comfortable. But my, all my slides are, are in English, okay? Uh, okay, so to begin, I'd like to introduce myself and my organization. My name is Ruben Cano. I'm a psychologist and a trainer in road safety and I work in the foundation of the National Confederation of Driving Schools, which has been around for about 60 years and which groups over 90% of all the road safety and driving schools in Spain. And so our goal here is to prevent accidents. And because we are driving schools, obviously we do so through training in road safety and through awareness racing. And so in this context, about two years ago, we started thinking about organizing this project in order to work with a new group of vulnerable users, which has grown recently. And these are the users of personal mobility devices. I think we're all aware of the fact that urban mobility has undergone a deep transformation in the last years. And a big part of that transformation has been due to the appearance of new mobility devices, including these personal mobility devices. And to give you a snapshot of the situation in Spain right now, we currently have about a million PMDs on our roads and streets, which is approximately 3% of all vehicles. And other studies show that almost 50% of Spaniards have already used one of these devices uh, before. Of course, how do we define a PMD? According to the traffic authorities definition in Spain, it's a vehicle equipped with one or more wheels with a single seat or space for a single person and propelled exclusively by an electric motor whose maximum speed will not exceed 25 kilometers per hour, which is actually quite a significant speed because of the characteristics of these vehicles. It, they can be quite dangerous even at that speed. Of course, this increase and in this proliferation in the last few years of these personal mobility vehicles is it a coincidence. Well, no, there are factors such as um, more congestion in the cities, greater awareness of the need for environmental protection, the rise in fuel prices, 
the restrictions imposed on cars, on diesel or gasoline cars in city centres. And of course, we shouldn't forget that it's a very attractive and very affordable means of transport for young people, and it does not require a driving license. Of course, in spite of all these advantages, well, there's also a lot of disadvantages to these vehicles because of their increasing numbers, we're still uh, having to adapt to their impact. On the one hand, a lot of the users of these vehicles are ignorant of traffic regulations because they're too young, they've not gone to driving school. And then for other users, particularly uh, traditional vehicles, it's also new having to coexist with these devices with all the risks that that entails. Just to give you an idea, just in 2020, which is the last year for which we have statistics, official statistics from our traffic authorities, eight users of personal mobility vehicles died in accidents, 97 were seriously injured, and over a thousand were slightly injured. In order to deal with this new challenges, our traffic regulations have changed recently, especially for PMDs. And there's, for example, that speed limitation to 25 kilometers per hour. They have to be equipped with a certificate to guarantee some of the technical characteristics. They are not allowed to run on sidewalks, which is something that used to happen very often, or in interurban roads. There, it's also not allowed to, of course, you may not drive them if you exceed maximum alcohol uh, levels or under the influence of drugs. You're not able to use or allowed to use headphones whilst driving one of these devices. But in spite of all of this, there are surveys that show that about 60% of the users of these vehicles are unaware of the applicable regulations. And so since we realized that this was becoming a serious problem about two years ago, towards the end of the lockdowns, we decided to design a training program for the most vulnerable users, which are the younger users, because as I said, they have not yet gotten a driver's license, and so they've not gone to driving school and uh, do not know the regulations and how to handle these vehicles. And so our goal was to train young PMD users so they can acquire the knowledge, skills, and attitudes necessary for safe driving of these vehicles. Our target population were young people between 12 and 18 years of age which is the age when they start using these devices. And the methodology we used for this training included both theoretical and practical training. But in any case, it was always taught by professional driving instructors in partnership with the local police forces. Training courses took about four hours two hours for theory and two for practical training. And to finish, I'm just going to show you the contents of the program. As I said, there's an in-classroom part where we talk about the different types of mobility devices and their characteristics, the traffic regulations that are applicable to these vehicles, as well as all the traffic signs and signals that they will frequently come across, safety recommendations in terms of personal protection equipment and so on, biodynamics, uh, collision, stability in, of PMDs, as well as risk factors in driving these vehicles, especially alcohol and drug consumption. And as for the practical training, we had them drive around a closed circuit with traffic signs, balance tests, normal and emergency braking, turns and U-turns, zigzags. And a really interesting part was also to introduce 
some glasses to simulate the effects of drugs uh, or alcohol so they could feel what it would be like to drive and what the effects might be of driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs. It's a program which has been running two years now and so far about 500 young people from different Spanish cities have gone through these courses. In Madrid, Avila, Albacete, Palma de Mallorca and we are going to continue to teach these courses in different schools around the country. And that's all. Thank you very much. And these are my contact details. Thank you, Ruben. Very um, efficient. Thank you very much. The next uh, um, one will be uh, online, and uh, um, I'm delighted to welcome Katarzyna Dobranska Junko from uh, the uh, Malopolska region in the Poland. Um, to talk about the road safety network. Kasia, the floor is Hello, good afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon, Antonio. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for having this opportunity today to speak um, uh, to you, to share our opportunity from our Polska region from Poland. Um, unfortunately, this is online, but uh, I hope that next time it will be possible to, to meet in person. Um, I would like to share with you some uh, some thoughts and our experience from Poland, from a region of south of Poland, where, which is Małopolska. So uh, today I would like to share with you some background. Uh, Uh, safety, our new ambassadors for road safety, how we call it, and our road safety network. So uh, allow me just uh, some few words about uh, about Małopolska. Małopolska is a region, one of the 16 regions in Poland. Uh, it is located in the south of Poland. Um, we have uh, three and a half million of um, uh, inhabitants and um, we are very touristic region, both in summer and winter, which has a very uh, big impact also on our, um, on our uh, tourism and obviously on uh, traffic the safety, on, on road safety, on mobility. Uh, one more important factor is also the proximity to Ukraine. Uh, which, uh, which also influenced uh, obviously the global uh, road safety plan for 2021 and 2030. Uh, Poland, uh, when we speak about Poland, I would like to share with you only uh, one thought about new regulations because last two years, uh, we have uh, we have introduced here in Poland new regulations, very important regulations that have influence on road safety. Uh, these uh, regulations concern uh, pedestrians, um, priority of pedestrians on on crossings, uh, uh, also uh, speed speed limits, uh, very strong enforcement and new uh, penalties regarding road safety. Uh, and uh, education programs. So uh, all of them are very important to see as a whole in Poland and also in our region. Uh, as I've, uh, as and the first region and so far the only one who implemented the, uh, the plan, the program for, uh, for the region, Isma Wopolska is the region that today uh, I represent, um, so the region, uh, region of Małopolska, but not only because I would like also to share with you some thoughts on behalf of uh, European Federation of Road Traffic Victims that I uh, also represent. So um, the global, uh, obviously, uh, goal for our uh, region is to have uh, the reduction of by minimum 50% of number of uh, fatalities and obviously a number of injured, uh, including seriously injured. Uh, this is uh, about the region, but what's important to say and to mention that, that in each region we have road safety councils. Uh, so um, the road safety council
responsible for road safety, police, firefighters, uh, emergencies, uh, non-profit organizations, inspection, road um, traffic inspection, traffic center, educational centers, um, uh, universities. Uh, so whole um, circle of specialists that work for road safety. So these councils uh, are a great um, opportunity to, um, to, um, to, to gain experience and to intershare, to share the experience that we that we uh, have. Uh, this allows us to, uh, to, to obviously reduce the number of fatalities, to reduce the number of, uh, of injuries. Uh, in Poland, um, our region is the first one when it comes to uh, road safety. Uh, but I'll try to do it as as um, as well as it possible. What are the main problems of our region, uh, and what was the response for these problems? Uh, obviously, each project uh, starts when it's um, uh, with with data, with with uh, with uh, uh, verified uh, information. In our case, this, the problems, the main problems of Małopolska are excessive speed, obviously, uh, vulnerable road users, I mean, pedestrians, young drivers, um, and road infrastructure. Uh, so far, we have managed to, to implement a very good uh, project for pedestrians, illumination of uh, pedestrian crossings in our region, joined with education and post-crash response with the help of European Federation of Road Traffic Victims, was, for example, with young drivers. And here is the response for, the, uh, for this uh, problem of young drivers in our region. Uh, the, the response is the program uh, Road Safety Network, uh, which is dedicated um, to teenagers between 12 and 18. Uh, uh, and it is very important to reach the regions that are uh, indicated as the most risky regions and uh, and the regions where uh, the most road crashes uh, uh, occur. So um, we have uh, selected the regions of our uh, Małopolska and um, and uh, the, the risk uh, group, I mean teenagers that I have mentioned. We have created Um, uh, attitude, uh, building responsible community. This is very important to not only to speak about laws, but also to uh, share them and to uh, build a community that, would, community that would like in the future to spread this information and how we call it to build a future road safety ambassadors. Uh, that's why we uh, use educational method, peer-to-peer -peer method. Uh, which we also use it with other programs. We uh, we are making uh, um, evaluate. Uh, we are uh, implementing workshops uh, based on explaining part. So these are the main rules that we explain. But later, uh, obviously, we uh, implement case studies. Uh, we work in groups. We make brainstorming, and we also. Have, um, real uh, case studies from each region that we uh, work. So uh, we work obviously in on, on each uh, workshop. We work with police, with firefighter, with emergencies from local uh, place that we act, and we analyze, for example, um, exactly uh, one of the crashes that uh, happened in the region. Um, uh, and we, uh, together with, uh, obviously with, with teenagers, uh, try to do and to think what to do to avoid this could happen in the future. So this is the five, these are the five main uh, 
um, points that we are uh, that we base on our uh, workshops. Uh, as I've mentioned, the first one is knowledge. So we pass. Uh, we make case studies with them uh, from the regions. We uh, also um, implement practical exercises from the first aid, that this is very important. Mm -hmm. uh, we also, um, we also uh, um, implement art, art workshop that I will uh, later show some photos. Um, on the main road safety areas. So, um, safe pedestrian, safe vehicle, safe infrastructure, safe system. And uh, last but not least, uh, Vision Zero workshop that uh, has been uh, prepared with uh, roads, uh, European Federation of Road Traffic Victims, uh, FEVR. Uh, so, we, um, we show the, the victim's perspe perspective uh, uh, which is very However, we have always fighted for this, the difference between uh, accident and crash. So obviously uh, we, we are speaking about uh, crashes, not accident, and uh, uh, a workshop on acceptable number of crashes, which is obviously uh, zero. Uh, we also implemented a view from perpetrator perspective of the uh, of the uh, consequences, prediction and consequences of a of a crash. So um, this is very, um, uh, I would say, it's not a lesson; it's a workshop uh, for all young uh, people to show and to make them think. Uh, the most important is that we guide them a little bit, but uh, 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 but they uh, they decide what to think. They and how to help societies, their societies, when where they live many times in the rural areas. So um, here are some uh, photos that uh, uh, to show that these were not only words. Uh, uh, one, uh, the first slide shows uh, the, the panel of the knowledge when we share our knowledge with them. Uh, the second one is uh, art workshop on uh, different areas of infrastructure of uh, road safety sorry uh, we only have we also have road crash case study to solve um, exactly the crashes that happened in in their region and to think and to prevent and to propose also directly to the police and to I connect to the uh, program, as I said, um, related to related to uh, road safety. Um, example of educational uh, education materials uh, that we also prepare for them. We also always analyze, obviously, the the group age group um, that we want to um, that we want to uh, get. Mm -hmm. Here are some uh, educational materials also prepared in Ukrainian uh, language because we had to act quickly uh, this year and um, and we also prepared all the new regulations, all the most important road safety rules for um, uh, for Ukrainians for in their language. Uh, so this is very important to also to to react quickly and to to get to all the regarding the scooter laws uh, that was also implemented uh, last year, a new um, law for e-scooters. So this was a very positive change here in Poland also, and we, uh, we could 
uh, react also and uh, pass uh, the, on during these workshops this uh, information. Um, so what uh, what I like today, uh, our colleague from Norway today shared that very important thing, and I, I have to agree with this, that um, it's not about only implementation of the project. It's about continuation. It's about keeping alive the project. So we have implemented this project two years ago. We are keeping it alive. What is important, we are evaluating it, uh, obviously, without any evaluation. Waiting it. We are working with many partners in this project, as I've, I have mentioned: police, fire uh, department, local authorities, non-profit organization. Uh, strengthening our partnerships in the region and creating road safety network. So this is not very still um, a very big project, but I think it's a, a worth mentioning, worth sharing. We also have as a council projects dedicated to all the groups of um, uh, road safety um, uh, users, uh, road users, sorry. Uh, so, um, so I hope that in the future we could also uh, share uh, more projects that, uh, that, that will be uh, implemented and that we implement here also with other partners from Poland, but also from, uh, from other parts. Of. Um, and uh, and I think that uh, what I can say at the end of our, my presentation is that the partnerships, the cooperation in our case is very, very important. And I think that uh, the, um, we share our experience, but we, we also learn from others. So uh, thank you very much for today take, having this opportunity. I am really sorry not to be in person, but hope that next time it will be uh, possible. So thank you very much, uh, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kasia from uh, uh, Madrid. And uh, um, next speaker is also online, um, Alena Dankova from uh, uh, the Czech Transport Research Center is also the uh, panel expert for the country and uh, uh, she was supposed to be here. Unfortunately, there was a last uh, um, uh, moment upset that um, prevented her from joining us in person, but uh, uh, she still um, kindly wanted to give the presentation. So, Alena, the floor is yours. She's just connected. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Alena Dankova. I am working in Transport Research Center in the Czech Republic, and I am responsible for the traffic education and financial side uh, of the road safety measure. Uh, I would like to uh, present our experience with the traffic education in the Czech Republic in the primary school. Uh, so please the slide four, I'm sorry. Yeah, Elena, they are about to come. Um, and the, and the, and the second, second slide, please. So the traffic, uh, the second slide, please. So oh, thank you. Sorry. Oh, thank you. Okay, Good. I'll do it for you. You can ask. Uh, the traffic education in the Czech Republic uh, is started in the Czech school education system, concrete in the Education Act. But uh, in the Education Act is uh, traffic education only in general level. The specific level and concrete activity are including uh, in the framework education program. This framework education program uh, are created by Ministry of Education in the Czech Republic, uh, this framework uh, education program is the national level, as very important is that is only for the basic education. So,
a school educational program and this uh, own program uh, would like to specifically complete education for the children in the in the traffic education. Next slide, please, please. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, in the Czech Republic, the traffic education is not in the school subject on its own, and uh, each school have to create its own specific uh, plan for the teaching uh, the traffic education. For example, uh, the concrete uh, is the in the three education areas. They are, for example, health, sports, uh, and a man in the world. But uh, very important uh, is the practical experience, the teachers and the pedagogues and another next next slide, please. Thank you. The ensuring the traffic education uh, is in uh, Ministry of Transport, concrete in the Road Safety Department. The CDV Transportation Center is collaborated with Ministry of Transport, and uh, we are created a lot of methodology material with Ministry of Transport. They are, for example, uh, certificate methodology for the uh, teacher education video, we are making uh, special seminars, uh, guidelines, and, uh, and, other, and other materials. There is good that we are a very good relationships between Ministry of Transport and also with Ministry on School and Education, and we can create it, this uh, important document all together. In You, but um, we seem to have the, a problem, uh, Alena. Uh, sorry, so, uh, I don't know if you can hear me. We we have actually um, a little problem with the audio. Um, that is uh, not your problem. It's from our side. Um, so uh, I'm really sorry, but we need to restart the computer. Uh, so if you if you uh, don't mind, uh, uh, we we can start your present. We can resume your presentation again in around 15 minutes if you don't mind, because we need to restart the computer. Is that okay for you? Uh, yeah, it's okay, no problem. Okay, in the meantime, for those who are following online, we will actually show the next uh, presentation, which is uh, uh, the one on uh, uh, the road safety uh, charter from uh, uh, Sophie Van Hoff from the VS Institute, which will uh, um, allow uh, us in the meantime to um, restart the computer. So, um, thank you. Hello everyone. My name is Sophie Van Hover and Hello I work everyone. as a project My officer name is Sophie Van Hover and Institute. I work as a project Fiat officer Institute at the Fias Institute. Fias Institute is a research center for road safety, safety and security in Belgium. Um, today I would like to discuss with you how we can engage citizens in improving road safety and therefore I want to give a short talk on the European Road Safety Charter. So, um, of course, I will talk a little bit about the history of the Charter, why it exists um, and how it works on a day-to-day -day basis and also how you can join the Charter. But I will also highlight um, a few good practices from our members who have a focus on um, young people. So, if we want to go back to the origin of the European Road Safety Charter, we need to go back to the year 2003. 2003 was a devastating year for road safety. In one year, we had 40,000 um, deaths on our European roads and 1.7 million people got injured. Road crashes became the main cause of death for people under the age of 45 years old. So it was clear that we had to change something in order to improve our roads. And therefore, the European Commission decided that they wanted to target the whole civil society um, to improve road safety and wanted to really encourage all these stakeholders to develop and share activities and knowledge with each other. So therefore they decided to create the European Road Safety Charter in 2004 and today we're happy to announce that in 2022 uh, we are the largest civil society platform on road safety globally and have over 3,500 members. The main goal of the Charter is to help to um, 
to obtain vision zero, so they have zero casualties by 2050. And we want to do this by really encouraging our members um, to take action, to organize events, to organize projects on road safety, and to share all their experiences and knowledge with each other. So not only on a regional or a national level, but also on a European level. Um, and to facilitate a dialogue at all levels, to really connect members with each other and also to connect them with the European Commission. So how does this work on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, first, um, we have, of course, the charter team. The charter team exists of two organizations. We first have Ricardo, um, who is the main project manager of the project. And then we have VS Institute. VS Institute um, is responsible for the animation of the National Relay Network, which I will explain in a minute. And we are also um, the Belgian National Relay. Most of important in our charter are, of course, our over 3,500 members. But who can join the charter? Well, actually, everyone can join the charter um, because everyone um, has something to do with the roads. Everyone um, uses our roads. So the safety on the roads is a responsibility of everyone. And therefore, we welcome enterprises, research centers, schools, nonprofit organizations, governments, of all sizes. So whether it is an entity of two people or whether it's an international entity, we welcome them all and all European um, countries can join um, the Charter. What they all have in common is that they share the four principles of the Charter. Of course, obviously, they need to care about road safety. And secondly, they also need to act upon it. So they need to be willing to organize events or projects, research projects um, to improve road safety depending, of course, on their own size um, and financial supports. Um, and third, they also need to be uh, willing to support other um, entities who are um, occupied with road safety. And um, last but not least, they also need to be willing to share all the knowledge, all the experiences they have with other members so that they can learn from each other and they can all together um, work together to um, improve our road safety. With the Charter, they are then able to share their good practices, activities and events. Um, we can also assist them in gaining more knowledge and experiences. Um, and also interesting to know is that members do not have any legal requirements. Um, so when they sign up for the Charter, they commit to um, improving road safety. So they, it's, like, it's like a pledge, but they have no legal requirements. And this is definitely interesting for the um, smaller types of members. We welcome all types of members from all um, member states, but of course this also means that our members are all facing different types of problems because every region, every country is facing their own road safety challenges, they have their own political issues, they have their own language. And of course, for us, the international aspect is very important that there is a sharing of knowledge on a European level, but we also want to help our members on the local level. And therefore, we um, created the National Relay Network. So national relays are can be seen as national ambassadors. So these are organizations who have road safety as their core activity. Um, and who have a very strong local presence. So they know what is going on in their country within road safety. They know the issues and the challenges. They have a wide network. They know which stakeholders are active um, and they can really help um, with improving the charter on a local level. Um, so what are their tasks or what are the goals? Um, of course, they help with the promotion of the charter on a national level. They can do this for, by example, explaining the charter to their own local network, to share it on their social media, um, to go to conferences and local events and talk about the charter there. Um, so this is a really important and crucial element. And um, secondly, they also help um, the members we already have. So members can, of course, contact the charter team, but some members maybe do not speak English or feel more comfortable with contacting um, a more local organization. So then they can contact in the National Relay um, with any questions. Often the National Relay will also um, organize one-to-one -one meetings um, at certain moments to discuss what they can do for the charter or to discuss any um, elements 
of the projects. Thirdly, they also help us with tailoring the communication. So we have, for example, our newsletter, which I will talk about in a minute, and we would translate it, um, this to all local languages. National really help us to um, find any mistakes or to tailor a little bit more. And national relays also give us information about what is going on in their country, maybe some interesting events, some new statistics that were uh, made public, so that we can also share these um, in our newsletters. Or, for example, if we share some information with our national relays, natu national relays can then decide whether it is interesting for some certain members or not, um, and then really tailor the communication per member specifically. And then fourthly, which is also a very important element for us, is that national relays are able to give us also feedback on the charter. So national relays hear a lot from their members. They know what is going good, what can be improved, what is maybe a bit unclear, and they can give this information to the charter team so that we can make the charter even better. So this two-way communication is a very important element of the charter. Um, so we have a national relay for each member, uh, for each um, member state. Uh, for example, VS Institute for Belgium, Transport Malta for Malta, Panos Minanos uh, Road Safety Institute for Greece, um, HAC um, Auto Club for Croatia, and for example, also Fundación Mapfre for Spain. Um, so if you have any um, questions um, concerning the charter, you can always contact um, these national relays. So how does the charter work on a day-to-day -day basis? Most importantly is our website. This is our main tool. And here um, people can, um, the members, they can share good practices, activities, and events. Um, this, this website is also um, completely public, so everyone can read this information. And here they give, for example, if they um, fill in elements for a project, they need to say what activities they did, um, with which partners they worked together, how they evaluated their project, what went good, what went bad, what could maybe be improved next year. And so this information is very valuable for other members to read. If, for example, they want to do a project on for example, elderly or vulnerable road users, they can search for these types of projects and see what worked and what didn't work. So this is very valuable information. It also gives a lot of visibility to the members um, if they want to improve their network, um, if they want to collaborate with other types of members, it is also easy for them um, to access all this information via the website. Also, if there are any interesting events coming up, they will also be online on the website. Then we have our quarterly newsletter. This newsletter is really specifically only for members, so they um, receive it quarterly. And here we give some updates about the charter specifically, so any new um, activities that are coming up from the charter team, any updates on, for example, the website, we will share it there. Um, also updates on road safety in general, for example, if the European Commission um, promotes some new events or made some new statistics available, we will also share it here. Um, any events that are coming up will all be also be shared on um, the newsletters. If there are some members who really gave some best practices on the website, um, who are really very good examples of how we can improve our road safety, we'll also highlight, highlight it again on our newsletter to um, give them even more visibility. And the same go up for our social media channels. So also here we can um, improve the visibility of our members. Another important element of the Road Safety Charter is the Excellence in Road Safety Awards. Each year we organize these events. Um, so the call for the awards go online between March and June, and then in October we have the awards ceremony. So what are these awards? These awards are um, the ultimate recognition of members for their good practices. So these are not good practices, these are really best practices um, that really demonstrate that they change something in road safety regionally, locally, um, nationally or internationally. Um, and these are really yeah, the, best the best projects in Europe at the moment. Um, these best practices are evaluated by the charter team and an external, uh, external judges, and they are based on their innovativeness, their creativity, transferability, impact. When we do this evaluation, we of course also take into account um, from which country they are. 
Um, so often they really specifically target an issue that is happening in their country. So this is also very important for us. And we also take into account what is innovative per member state, because we see that, for example, in Belgium or the Netherlands, there are other types of trends and other things are very impactful and innovative, while, for example, in Bulgaria, it will be something completely different or they will have a completely different approach. And this is also important for us that we don't, we don't only evaluate them on a European level, but also on a national level. We also have different categories each year so that um, we can target as many different members as possible. This year, for example, we had a focus on technology, on young people and on uh, professional drivers. But next year, these categories can be completely different. So the shortlisted candidates are then announced um, beginning of September and um, the, in the award ceremony, during the award ceremony in Brussels in October, um, the shortlisted candidates will be invited and the winners will receive their award from the European Commission. This award ceremony can also be um, followed online and you can still register for the ceremony via the website of the Charter. It is a really interesting award ceremony where you will not only see the winners and hear about their project, but also um, different members of the European Commission will come and talk about um, the Charter and about road safety in Europe. So now I will talk a little bit about some good practices. First, I will talk about two shortlisted candidates of this year for the category of young people. And then I'll also talk a little bit about a winner of last year. So the four um, shortlisted candidate of this year comes from Belgium and is actually a project that was created in close collaboration with VSV. Um, so in Belgium we have the big road safety test um, for children where we um, try to discover how their knowledge is about road safety and how aware they are of the potential dangers in traffic. Unfortunately, uh, we saw that these statistics are not that good, the results are not fantastic, and therefore the city of Leuven decided that they wanted to create a new way of, um, for young people to learn about traffic and also to help teachers to give uh, road safety classes in a more innovative um, and impactful way. Therefore, they um, created a serious game in virtual reality. Um, in this game, they can um, do all kinds of challenges, um, 21 different scenarios. Um, and by doing this, they can improve seven different skills. For example, um, their placements in traffic, giving priority to other vehicles, dead corners and those kind of things. Um, so this is a really interesting way for young children to learn more about traffic. It's, it's re it really uses a lot of gamification. They can win badges um, when they do good things. So this makes it more interesting for them to learn about road safety. The layout of the game was also um, created together with the children. So it's in a very, made in a very attractive way. And the content was created um, together with universities. For example, the virtual reality is a very good way to um, to really motivate children um, to learn about road safety and the steering wheel that they added also further improves the reality of the tests. Uh, when the young children participate in this game, they will also receive personalized feedback and this feedback is also available for the teacher. Um, and this helps the teacher to then um, tailor the content that she will give or he or she will give in her classes even more and to better understand the strengths and weaknesses in her own class. A second um, project or the second shortlisted candidates comes from France. In France, um, one out of um, five people who die in a crash are unfortunately people between the age of 18 and 24 years old. Um, and when Fondation Vinci Autoroutes discovered these statistics, they decided that they wanted to create a project to um, improve um, road safety um, for these people. So they've developed a research program on risk prevention. So they did all kinds of surveys and interviews with um, young people. And they also organized a big conference where um, psychologists and other experts came to talk about the issues that young people are facing right now and why um, they um, have so many car crashes or other types of crashes in traffic. Um, unfortunately, we all know that distraction is um, a 
a very difficult issue that we see right now um, in road safety and also Fondation Vinci discovered that distraction is one of the main issues why there are so many deaths in France. So they developed a video campaign focusing on distraction. For this video campaign, they um, worked together with two influencers, um, a famous YouTuber and an actor. And in the video, um, the actor will be driving and he will be receiving um, a few texts from his girlfriend. And the YouTuber, he acts like a kind of ghost that tells him to answer the phone, to send her a little text. It only takes a few minutes. He knows the route he is going, so there is no danger at all. So they also really um, show the peer pressure that a lot of young people are feeling um, when driving and, for example, receiving texts. But of course, the actor does not do that. He ignores his phone because he thinks that his life is more important than replying to a text message. The video um, was viewed over 2.2 million times on social media and had 35,000 um, views on YouTube. So this is quite a lot. And this also shows, for example, that projects that use influencers can really gain a lot of visibility. So this was um, a second shortlisted candidate of this year. So if you want to discover the other two shortlisted candidates and who the winner is, then definitely um, take a look at the Charter website and register for the awards ceremony. Um, and then we have a winner of last year. Um, so last year we had a winner from Romania, Fundacia Siguranza Autocopy. In Romania, only 25% um, of the children um, are safely restrained um, in the car. So this is are quite dramatic um, statistics. And therefore, Fendacia Siguranza Autocopy um, decided that they want to improve this. And by 2025, they want to increase this number to 70%. Um, how do they want to do this? Well, they decided to give free safety classes car seat installation instructions and first aid trainings, not only to, ch to parents, but also to the children themselves, caregivers and teachers to really inform them how they can safely transport their child. Besides that, they also um, gave free child seats to um, parents who could not afford it so that they could improve the safety of their children. And in return, uh, um, Fundacia Siguranta Autocopy took um, the old car seats, recycled them and turned them into child furniture. Then they sold this um, furniture and the money received from these sellings um, were given to children hospitals. So this project also really shows a very nice way how you can improve road safety um, for young children and also how you can connect it with other good causes like for example child hospitals. In one year they um, succeeded in improving their statistics from 25% to 30% and the project is still ongoing. So these are three short, pro the short introductions to three um, interesting projects and of course you can discover all um, award submissions for this year also on our website so definitely take a look there. So if you now would like to join the charter, if you would like to share knowledge together with other members, um, then you can just simply go to the website and there you can um, simply join the charter by creating um, an account. Uh, if you have any questions, um, then you do not, has, can, do not hesitate to contact either me via my email address or you can always contact me um, via LinkedIn. Or you can also contact, of course, one of the national relays who are all um, public on our websites. I would like to thank you um, for your attention. If you have any questions, do not hesitate to ask me um, and I wish you a very good day. Thank you. Goodbye. Um, nice and informative presentation from the VS Institute and Sophie about uh, uh, the road safety charter. Now, Alena, we're back. Uh, we'll give it a second try. Uh, we should have solved uh, the problem. We apologize for this. And uh, uh, we would like to propose that uh, uh, we start again from uh, slide one, uh, because this will help us, because we were missing some of your uh, sentences already in the very first slide. So uh, if you don't mind, we would like to benefit the most of your presentation. All right with you? No. Not so, yet. Uh, yeah. 
Okay, yeah, very good. Now we have you. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll run the slides for you, so do not hesitate each time you need uh, 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 to move on. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, one more. My name is Alena Dankova. I am working in Transport Research Center in the Czech Republic, and I am responsible for the traffic education in the Czech Republic uh, and for the financial side of the road safety measures. I would like to tell here uh, some uh, practical experience with the traffic education uh, in the Czech Republic. So the traffic education by us uh, is state uh, in the Czech school education system concrete uh, in the Education Act. Uh, in the Education Act is include in the framework education program. Uh, this program uh, was created by the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Transport. And uh, this program is uh, for the national level and only for the basis, uh, basic education. So it supports the autonomy of the schools and describe the expect outputs of the couples. The next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, the traffic education is not a school subject uh, on its own and uh, each school in the Czech Republic have to create its own plan uh, for the implementing traffic education in the school. And it is implemented uh, with these three education area. They are health, sports and math. And from this subject for the traffic education. Next slide, thank you. Uh, the main authority for the traffic education by us is the Ministry of Transport and the Ministry uh, of the School and Education. Concrete, uh, the Road Safety Department. Uh, we, Transport Design Center, we are corroborate uh, a lot of years with the Ministry of Transport and uh, together we are created a lot of education material, a certificated methodology, uh, we are organized together seminars for the pedagogue, we are making educational uh, activities and video uh, and others activity. So I think uh, by us is very important to do good co collaboration with this Ministry of Transport and our institute. important the financial side so the funding uh, is specific that each school have uh, our budget and of Brno and uh, the city uh, thinks a part uh, of this budget uh, I will tell about it in in the next slide. Uh, so here, uh, can you can you see the education material uh, that uh, we was created? There are, for example, guidelines for the second grant of the basic school, the guidelines for the education in the traffic playground and the practice in the playground. Uh, also, the education video guideline for the. they are certificate. Uh, next slide, slides please. Uh, we are also uh, produced the specific educational videos. Uh, all those videos you can uh, see in our website. Uh, they are free and uh, this video are uh, for the teacher, for the children and also for the parents and they include uh, important information about the road safety measures, uh, about uh, the safe moving children and uh, another activity. Next slide. Mm -hmm. We are also uh, making the workshop for the teacher. 
The next year, uh, we educated more than 2,000 teachers in the Czech Republic. I think that uh, it's Uh, give us the new information for the creating the new materials. All these workshops are free. Uh, they are also recording and uh, all the recorder are free available in the in this website Díky do Pravě. Uh, so uh, we have a good program of the education for the basic school here in Brno. This program uh, is for two years here and is funded by, by the Bruno City. Uh, this program uh, includes uh, four, four areas toward the theory in the school, uh, also the practical exercise, exercise and walking uh, and around uh, in the school. And the topic is for, for example, cyclist, car, passenger, public transport, user, and so on. Very good is uh, they we are playing a game with the children. We are with worksheet, uh, and we very good is here the cooperation between us, the teacher, and and the child. Uh, here can you see, for example, our materials. Uh, they are the coloring book, uh, rebus, and other material. We don't uh, we don't making the presentation because a lot of school don't have good uh, IT technique for the presentation. So we have a lot of paper, a lot of uh, bills, and uh, this this paper. Okay, five minutes, and uh, the special topic uh, are uh, e mobility, micro mobility, uh, analysis of traffic accident. Uh, in this time, special the uh, cycling, pedestrian, and another this topic. Very good is here discussion between teacher and between uh, the children about uh, the various traffic situation. Uh, very good uh, for us and uh, also for the children uh, are practical exercises on the traffic playground. In the Czech Republic, we have 150 playground and in this playground, we are teaching the children uh, good habitants uh, in, the, in, the, in the road. Teachers, we had uh, 25, uh, 25 bicycle and uh, 10 scooters. The scooters uh, are for the small child, they cannot able go good with the cycle. We are teaching the good rules of the safe bicycle, practical, practical examples of the situation, the good riding on the traffic playground and all this activity. I think that uh, the playground uh, with the bicycle is for the children uh, very good and also uh, very interesting because they, there is the safe place who the children can good moving and learn uh, the good habitants. And uh, the next activity here is talking with the children and with the teacher around the school. Uh, and uh, we are speaking about the various type of the pedestrian crossing, uh, about uh, reflective where uh, where is good place for play and another this this activity. 
Uh, and uh, our goal, and I think that the goal of our uh, is the vision zero. So reduction of the number of severity of children's traffic accidents and good uh, education of the te teacher, because I think that uh, the education and traffic education is very important and can reduce, reduce the number uh, of the children's traffic accidents. Uh, thank you for the attention. And uh, if you have Thank you very much, um, Elena. Thanks for uh, um, connecting remotely. Thanks for uh, um, making sure the presentation was possible. And uh, um, I'm now um, delighted to give uh, um, the floor to Jesus again for uh, um, some um, closing remarks on uh, um, today's workshop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antonio. And uh, first of all, I think I must apologize for the technical problems that we've encountered during this afternoon. Uh, I hope that you were able to follow with the greatest slides and, and, and uh, all the enthusiasm of, of the presenters. Don't want to take a lot of time, some brief uh, takeaways. Thank you, Antonio. And um, the, there are very deorganized, and so don't wait uh, don't, for, for a summary of today's session. It would be impossible to to summarize everything that was presented today. But uh, you know, one of the first um, keywords that I wrote down was uh, evaluation, again. Uh, I think that the LEARN project is uh, providing an unprecedented uh, amount of evidence of um, the effectiveness of uh, road safety education, although we th I think that we still have to reinforce that part. I remember a lot of conversations in, at the United Nations with international organizations uh, where someone was telling me that uh, there's no evidence that education works. And, you know, uh, from um, a humanistic point of view first, I think that we must keep our commitment uh, towards education. We cannot uh, enforce, we cannot expect what has not been uh, explained at the school uh, at the first place, but providing more scientific evidence on, on how um, education is, is actually working and changing attitudes and reducing crashes at the end of the day is, is still a challenging and open issue. Also, universal education. We've seen that, you know, some people are lucky that, you know, they're getting good education. Other people are not uh, so lucky. So the, we should be facing these disparities, this uh, educational safe mobility or sustainable mobility divide or gap into in, in Europe. And, and LEARN is also emphasizing in one of its key principles, um, this uh, universal education. Uh, we, it was uh, referred, uh, mentioned a couple of times, or several times today that uh, there are two types of people or two types of road users sharing the same asphalt traffic lanes. Those who know the rules and those who don't. And that's actually very dangerous. Um, I remember one sentence, by the way, some time ago that they said that there are three types of people, those who know how to count numbers and those who doesn't. So that's, it took me some time to understand the sentence, but it's a good one. Also, we've seen a lot of amazing examples from all around Europe that also brings the value of learn, you know, in exchanging all this uh, creativity. We've seen uh, workshops on crash investigation for students in London. My first uh, work was actually doing crash investigation. I found that very interesting. Uh, detailed operational goals in, in Flanders. That was uh, amazing and, and, you know, it's really great to, to see, you know, how easy can we bring you know, education to, to schools and to teachers. We've seen this uh, great opportunity of um, um, hard zones in Norway. And uh, when I found it very interesting that the new schools, urban planning uh, includes uh, hard zones right from the beginning. So it was also mentioned that not every school has the same space around the schools to, to uh, cater for safe uh, 
uh, travel to school, but you know, looking into urban planning and how you know we don't want to keep making the same mistakes when we have that opportunity in new schools or new developments. We've seen examples, European projects from Panos Milonas in, in Greece, and uh, we've seen also PRP in Portugal, you know, this great, uh, even larger project compared to an Erasmus project, you know, they're complementary and, and on bo in both cases very interesting. The paradigm, paradigm shift, shift in Spain was uh, remarkable with the new legislation. Uh, so after 30 years, more than 30 years of education effort, efforts and, and commitment, after five years of the forum, the Spanish forum, which I think is also a very uh, useful platform for us in Spain, but for maybe other countries, we now have this um, new legislation, new framework, and I think that also the leadership of the Directorate for Traffic, you know, has to be acknowledged in that in that respect. We still have to do uh, to, to 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 go a long way uh, in order to bring down to the last teacher and student that uh, new uh, legislative framework and it was very interesting Maria Jose to see that you know you mentioned that uh, you know uh, police officers they were mentioned that we don't have any representative here but at some point it was you know very um, very fortunate to, to recall to remember and, and to acknowledge also police officers effort in traffic safety education but now we all need to relocate ourselves into the name the same framework in order to be complementary and, and also uh, to be at the end of the day very effective and um, also the examples from from Poland and you know teenagers and rural areas which uh, you know I cannot imagine probably a largest uh, biggest challenge than you know the teenagers moving around in rural areas uh, particularly during the weekends and also these vision zero workshops First aid, you know, it was mentioned in Poland and in other countries, you know, that's another issue that maybe we should also tackle uh, within the LEARN pro project. Uh, and training activities for scooter riders in Spain, that was also a great presentation. And um, there's, a, there's a classic study from Austin in Texas uh, showing that 30% of all the injuries happened during the first scooter e-scooter ride so you know there's a clear lack of of training there's also i think it's a uh, oslo hospital in norway which all tell us that uh, 50 percent of the injured uh, e-scooter riders had already received some kind of online training so the consequence is that this may not be enough and we are launching a press release uh, on thursday about e-scooters and we were reviewing some of these uh, studies and also very you know striking that 60 percent of the users uh, Ruben told us uh, didn't know don't know the traffic rules that, that's really scary and you know also coming to the end uh, the example of uh, Alena from the Czech Republic uh, each school had to create its own implementation so that's another big challenge and I hope that the LEARN project is helping in that respect. It was very encouraging also to see the LEARN project, how it is reflected in, in already ongoing or new activities in different parts of the world and I think that the LEARN project was mentioned in an Australian paper discussing education in the future so that's very encouraging for those who are committed to towards the project and um, Finally, the presentation from the European Road Safety Charter. As uh, Sophie mentioned, we are the national relay point here in Spain. We're very proud together with s several colleagues that are here today. And uh, we hope that you all are signatories uh, of the charter. If you are not, please uh, consider signing it. If you sign it, please uh, write that you are from Spain so we get more <laughs> credit you know, within the network. <laughs> And, and I think that's all. So congratulations again. I think that you know it's very clear that w there's a lot of things to do, and, and that uh, you know exchanging this um, valuable information is, is a real contribution towards road safety. Remember, please, you know that uh, we are now here sharing the, the joy of learning together. 
learn. It's about the learning. And, you know, we don't want to teach, but we want also to learn. And the, loin, the joy of learning is also the joy of saving lives. So thank you very much, and I hope that you had a, an interesting and useful day. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Nothing much to add to uh, the, the fantastic summer you've made. Uh, what remains to me is to uh, thank VSV and uh, the uh, MAPRE Foundation also for uh, the hospitality today in uh, um, this uh, um, beautiful theatre conference room. And uh, uh, of course, LEARN uh, will continue tomorrow. We already have uh, a meeting of uh, uh, the expert group and uh, we will continue discussing about uh, uh, what to do in the future. We have publications forthcoming. So uh, there is a lot to do and uh, we will uh, uh, do uh, a lot. Uh, big thank also to uh, Frank and Susanna for uh, uh, the um, technical organization for the day. Thank you very, very much for uh, making sure we could have all these nice speakers uh, um, lined up. And to those who came to uh, uh, the meeting in Madrid and, of course, to uh, all those of you who um, followed us online. Until the next time, thank you.